Howdy. You're well. Well, I am. Dave Smith. Pleasure. Good to meet you, sir. Yes, sir. Nice to meet you, too. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Durham Planning Commission. The members of the Durham Planning Commission have been appointed by the City Council and the County Board of Commissioners as an advisory board to the elected officials. You should know that the elected officials have the final say on any issues before us tonight. If you wish to speak on the agenda item, please go to the table to my left and sign up to speak. For those wishing to speak, please state your name and your address clearly when you come to the podium. Please speak clearly and into the microphone. Each side, those wishing to speak of an agenda item and those wishing to speak in opposition to an item have 10 minutes to present each side. The time will be divided amongst all persons wishing to speak. If you are here opposing the rezoning tonight, you should be aware of what's called a protest petition. A protest petition can be helpful to those residents who live in the rezoning area. Please consult the planning department staff for any details on the protest petition and they'll be happy to help you. You should also keep in constant touch with the planning department as to when your case will go before the elected officials for a final vote. 
finally, all motions are stated in the affirmative. So if a, mo if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is for denial. Thank you. Can we have roll call? Commissioner Beachwood? Present. Commissioner Beeland? Commissioner Board? Commissioner Davis? Present. Commissioner Gibbs? Present. Vice Chair Harris? Present. Chair Jones? Present. Commissioner Kimball? Commissioner Lamb? Present. Commissioner Paget? Commissioner Smudsky? Present. Commissioner Whitley? Present. Commissioner Winders? Present. We did receive an email today from Commissioner Kimball asking for an excused absence in which I granted him that excused absence. Do we have any adjustments to the agenda? Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Pat Young with the planning department. Um, we had intended to uh, request an adjustment for the um, resolutions in honor of the service of uh, former commissioners Martin and Mitchell Allen, but I don't see them in the audience tonight, and if they're not, we'll go ahead and keep that as item 7A. Uh, and it, just uh, as we discussed prior to the meeting, uh, give an opportunity for our two new members to introduce themselves briefly. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Also, with reference to uh, an official document that we have in our packet, if you look at Kent Corner, the plan amendment, it has case A120007. It should be A120017. So if you would make that notation, so when it go before the elected bodies, they would have the correct number in our docket for the plan amendment for Kent Corner. It should be one seven instead of seven. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, before we go on, we'd like to recognize two of our new members here on the Durham Planning Commission. We have uh, Mr. Will Lamb, and we have uh, Ms. Elise um, Beeland. Oh, great. So can we get approval of the minutes? Can we approve of the minutes? Second. That's been moved and properly second. All those in favor, let it be known by raising your right hand. Any opposition? The motion carries 12 to 0. All right, thank you. Okay. We'll move down to sec number 5, public hearing for a plan amendment and zoning map change for Dale Webb, Carolina Arbors, of the case. A120011 and zoning case Z120022. Mr. Chair, before I turn this over to the case planners, I'd like to certify for the record that all public hearing items before you tonight have been uh, properly notified in accordance with the provisions of law and their certifications to that effect on record with the planning department. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, I'm Hannah Jacobson with the Planning Department and I'll be presenting the plan amendment case A120011, Del Webb, Carolina Arbors. The applicant in this case is Horvath Associates and they are proposing to amend approximately 14.36 acres of the future land use map from low medium density residential to low density residential. This would change the allowable density on the site from between four to eight units per acre to four units per acre or less. The amendment does not impact the area uh, designated for recreation and open space that's shown in green that bisects the site. Uh, the project represents a southern expansion of a previously approved project, Del Webb Carolina Arbors, which is outlined in a red dashed line on the screen. It's located in eastern Durham, north of US Highway 70 and the Wake County line and south of Leesville Road. Uh, the site is in the suburban tier and the area of the plan amendment is not within a watershed overlay district. In their justification statement, the applicant suggests that it is environmental conditions, including streams and slopes and associated buffers, 
um, that those would be better protected under a low density uh, land use designation because it would be better able to mimic the, the site design would be better able to mimic the environmental conditions. Um, staff felt that this warranted further examination. So we did review the request against the four criteria for plan amendments that are found in the Unified Development Ordinance. Uh, we found that the proposed amendment is consistent with land use policies in the comprehensive plan for suburban tier residential density and for standards for contiguous development. Um, as I said before, the project is located in southeastern Durham and is in, in an area that's transitioning from uh, rural to more suburban. Across the border in Wake County is an area known as Briar Creek, which has it which has experienced significant retail, commercial, and residential growth in recent decades. So the proposed uh, land use density, low density land use is not out of character with the adopted land use plan uh, in Durham, nor is it, uh, nor with the recent development patterns um, in the area. So staff does find that this um, criteria is met. We also determined there not to be any substantial adverse impacts. The transportation and infrastructure impacts are being reviewed more comprehensively as part of the zoning case. Um, and despite the environmental features that are on site, the project can meet all of the environmental standards set forth in the UDO. And there is sufficient land on the future land use map to accommodate the proposed change. And finally, the site is of adequate shape and size to accommodate the proposed land use. So it meets all four of the criteria for plan amendments and staff is recommending approval. And for part two, uh, good evening. I'm Amy Wolf with the planning department. The zoning case associated with the plan amendment is case Z1200022, Del Webb, Carolina Arbors. The applicant is Horvath Associates. It, it is in with the city and county jurisdiction. The request is from the present designations of Plan Development Residential 3.700 and Residential Rural to the entirety of Plan Development Residential 3.700. Um, the acreage is 447.33 acres and the proposed use is for a mix of residential, single family, semi-attached, duplex, triplex, uh, also to include a clubhouse. The site is located on the south side of Leesville Road, north of Andrew Chapel Road. Uh, it is on the Durham and Wake County line. The different, you've seen this case before with previous zoning cases. Uh, this particular case is proposing to add 17 or 18 approximately acres uh, attached to the, or contiguous with the Wake County line uh, to the south of the site to bring it into one um, uh, continuous project. You can see also from this map that, and in the staff report, that development has been underway with this site and you can see here with the lotting pattern to the south um, shown on the map. And there is a portion of the site that is in the FJB watershed protection overlay. There are no streams uh, located within that area. The request does meet the required standards of the Unified Development Order Ordinance as summarized here for, for the uh, intensity of the site. The development plan shows the existing conditions of the site. You can see that there are streams, uh, st steep slopes, uh, streams shown here with there's some steep slopes within the stream and stream buffer. There's a power easement running through the site. Um, this is the northern portion of the site and shown here is the southern portion of the site and you can see where they began the lotting pattern. The proposed, the proposed uh, conditions of the site are shown here. They're uh, largely similar to what we've seen before with the previous zoning case. Um, there's a number of uh, access points. They're the same site access points. There's stream crossings shown, the north-south collector street, um, as well as uh, the appropriate buffers. Uh, to summarize, there, there are a number of commitments associated with this that uh, were carried over from the existing zoning for this proposal. 
the minimum commitments are it's the same total number of units for the site with the addition of the uh, approximately 18 acres. It's a total of 1,314 residential units of, a, of the mix as described, 13 sh potential stream crossings, 12 access points, 45% uh, maximum impervious surface and a minimum tree coverage of 20%. There's a number of graphic commitments which includes the, the lot layouts that's shown on the cover sheet of the development plan. The road layout which um, shows the north-south collector street, of course the plan would allow for other roads as well but the commitment was for this north-south co collector street as shown. The, there's six pot areas, the greenway trail easement, uh, there's a, a number of traffic improvements, the location of tree preservation and replacement areas and access points. There's a number of commitments as well. Um, the Greenway Trail, uh, and these are just a summary. I'm not gonna read them all, but the unit type, it, it is an age-restricted community. Uh, I mentioned some of these, um, and they are all listed in your staff report, and you and they are, are presently committed as part of the current um, development plan for the site. There's also a number of transportation um, it, traffic impact analysis uh, improvements required uh, in your staff report. They are the same ones uh, as present, presently approved and there's a number of design commitments for the units uh, or development. The request is not consistent with the future land use map. You just heard uh, Ms. Jacobson present the, the difference with that and is to be considered as a separate case. And the request does meet all the applicable policies of the comprehensive plan, uh, with the exception of the future land use map. And staff determines that should the plan amendment be approved, that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other policies and ordinances. Thank you. We have one person signed up to speak, Mr. Ron Horvath. Chairman Jones, members of the commission, thank you. My name is Ron Horvath, Horvath Associates. Glad to see you all tonight and welcome to our two new members. I wish you much patience. You will need it. Um, it's a good job. I uh, will be very quick tonight. This is adding 18 acres, as Amy said, to the overall development. The land is actually part, or was part of a larger track where we located a uh, regional pump station. Uh, there is a stream to the south and to the west of this property providing natural borders and to include it in our project seemed unnatural. In addition, we continue to have problems with density. We're still at 1,314 units uh, we're not increasing, we're just spreading out and providing more open space, uh, more area for stormwater treatment, and of course, uh, the arrangement of the lots. As I said, uh, this is in compliance with most of the adopted plans, and I believe uh, it will, one of the main reasons we're doing this is it will eliminate the perimeter project buffer that would run between the two parcels of land under the UDO and therefore put the perimeter buffer at the perimeter of the overall project. So I ask your concurrence tonight and approval. And any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Thank you. Is there anyone wishing to speak on this item? If not, I'll close the public hearing and bring it back before the commission. Does anyone want to speak up here? Mr. Gibbs, you. Uh, Mr. Horvath, I I have a couple questions, uh, and it's I'm, I understand this is uh, uh, a development for 55-ish and on up in age. Is that that's that correct? Is correct. Uh, just out of curiosity, what kinds of uh, provisions are being made for? I'll call it handicapped accessibility within the units and out and about the grounds. Uh, and simply because <clears throat> as people get older, and I'm assuming people can stay here until, yeah, till whatever. Uh, and I was just curious as to what provisions may be uh, in the works for for that. I, I know there's not a transportation route out there. Not yet. 
and hopefully that will come, which would benefit this too. Uh, uh, but if you could answer those questions for me, please. This, this is a 55 and older, what's called an active adult community. Uh, active being the key wo word. Um, we do provide, one of the design criteria for the street system is not to exceed 5%. Uh, the city standards for the public streets go up to 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 15%. So we're maintaining all streets at the handicap accessible rate of 5%, not to exceed. Driveway access, similar, and same with sidewalks. We're actually providing wider sidewalks in many areas uh, for golf cart usage. Um, it is a community plan that you can enter your house from the ground level and not multiple steps getting in. Uh, there is an activity center here that the site plan is just being completed now that the building itself is over 32,000 square feet. It has two pools, one indoor, one outdoor, uh, various courts, uh, a lot of recreation facility including a walking trail throughout the entire system. So yes, it is ADA compliant. Um, there will be areas where there's steps that we just can't get around, but there are, are alternatives for accessing those points. Well, thank you. I just wanted to be sure it wasn't going to be uh, so exclusive as to not be able to uh, admit those with whatever disabilities or infirmities they may have. Uh, Got what my other question was, which is not surprising, but I, that that answers most of my questions, and okay. I do appreciate that. I have a couple of questions. Uh, first, um, are you have will you have a, a bike pa uh, lane and sidewalks on the Connector Street? Yes, ma'am. Excellent. And um, how about the greenways? Uh, got. Has, uh, trails, we're we're constructing trails. those through our portion now. It goes beyond our site on some of the greenway trails. Uh, we're not doing those outside the project, but uh -huh. we are connecting everything up internally. That will be publicly accessible. Yes, ma'am. And another question: um, uh, There, I think there are going to be some traffic impacts on Lees Leesville Road, um, and there is mention of a connection to T. W. Alexander. That's Do already been made. It's, it's been done? Yes, ma'am. If you go out T.W. Alexander to where it used to stop, continue it's on. It's going to go all the way to your place. It goes to the front door at Andrews Chapel Road, which now provides a new north-south connector. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Commissioner Harris. Thank you. This is for staff. I'm looking at committed element number 11, which is a site for a fire station, not with a minimum of four acres. <clears throat> and I'm looking at the 50th certificate of occupancy. And they get that certificate of occupancy at the first day of the quarter. So I'm looking at 12 and a half years they have to satisfy this committed mm -hmm. element. No, we probably will have to, I'm sorry, we're gonna satisfy that in about three months. Okay, but according to this document here, you don't have to do it until the 50th successful certificate of occupancy, they, right? They have to complete it prior to receiving the 50th certificate of occupancy. Which is 12 and a half years. There's no time limit on receiving a certificate of occupancy. There's no commitment for receiving a, the commitments. It's as they're developed and built and inspected and but Mr. Okay. Harris, yes, sir. if I may, uh, the process is we plat the lots, build the infrastructure, plat the lots, then a building permit is obtained to construct the house. Okay. Before anybody okay. can move into it, you have to get a CO, a certificate okay. of occupancy. Okay. We're only allowed to sell and occupy 50 units before the fire station land has to be obtained. Okay. So out of 1,300, we're way at the very beginning of that. Does that help? That helps quite okay. a bit. Okay. I, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking 12 years, and then I looked at that committed element number 10, and that's 650. 
certificates of occupancy before you have to do the transportation piece of it. Correct. That's about halfway through the project. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Do we have anyone else wishing to speak? Yes, sir. Mr. Horvath, what you said about the fire station raised the question for me. This only has to provide the land. Correct. Okay. And uh, we, the city would have to provide the fire station at some point in the future. Correct. It's uh, actually being worked on uh, through general services, the, the planning of it now. Okay. So until that's built, where, where would the fire protection be coming from? With the existing uh, stations a little further west. One of the reasons they, well, they've asked for a fire, if you don't mind, I'll turn back. <laughs> sure. They've asked for a fire station in this location because of Brightleaf, Ravenstone. I can go through a number of the neighborhoods that have been constructed out there, and there's not an immediate station. There is a need in the area for one. Hence why it's so early in this project is they don't want to wait till the end of the project to get it. Uh, it will be serving Brightleaf, Doc Nichols, what is uh, Sierra's project name, another large development, this development, Ravenstone, uh, and anything else that's east of Sharon Road. Okay? Thank you. Mr. Page. Which fire station is going to service that one specifically? You know, I'm not sure, but I think it's Parkwood. Is it in the staff report, Amy? I think it, it not Parkwood, but um, the one at 98. Um, Bethesda. Bethesda, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I was going to say but Bethesda would probably be the closest yeah. one. Yeah, I believe that's it, but I'm, I won't, I can't commit, I don't know. Okay. All right. Okay. Anyone else? Can we get a motion? I'd like to make a motion to approve amendment, plan amendment, amendment case A120011. Second. All right, it's been moved and properly second. All those in favor, let it be known by saying, well, raising your right hand. Wrong meeting. All right. Thank you. Any opposition? Motion carries 12 to 0. Get up. Move approval of zoning case Z120022. Second. Been moved and properly second. All those in favor? Raise your right hand. Any opposition? The motion carries 12 to 0. All right. Thank, Thank you, sir. Okay. We'll move down to item 5B, Kent Corner. Kent Corner 2, Plan Amendment A120017, and Zoning Case Z130007. Good evening, I'm Laura Woods, and I'll be presenting case A12-00017. This um, case, pardon me. Sorry about that. Thank you. Just uh, activate it. Let's, thank you. This um, is submitted by Chapel Hill Development uh, LLC, and it suggests um, revising the future land use map three parcels with that are associated with the much larger zoning case. Uh, at the in the vicinity of Chapel Hill Street and Kent Street from medium density residential to commercial. This case was initially heard at the February 12th Planning Commission meeting. At that time the case was deferred and has been brought back this evening with a new zoning case, uh, 13 -0 -0 -0 -0 -0 -0 as you see, to the north of the site is the commercial, uh, the Chapel Hill Commercial District, and to the west, south, and 
East of the site is medium or low medium density residential. The applicant suggests that this would be a modest expansion of the West Chapel Hill Commercial District and that it would allow for revitalization of that commercial district. The applicant wishes to redevelop these three parcels and the larger par zone in the parcels uh, directly to the north as a mix of office and retail uses. Here are our four plan amendment criteria that we used in evaluating plan amendment cases. Staff found that the proposed land use change would be consistent with adopted policies and plans, specifically the urban teal, tier commercial infill uh, policy 2.2.3F. Staff evaluated it on the second criteria and found it consistent, uh, that it is compatible with existing and future land use patterns, and that uh, the proposal does not adversely affect or impact uh, infrastructure. That'll be discussed more fully in the zoning case. And finally, we found that it was of adequate size and shape to accommodate uh, the proposed use. Therefore, staff recommends approval based upon the four criteria. Thank you. Good evening, Amy Wolf again with the planning department. This is the zoning case for Kent Corners 2, uh, Z130007. The applicant is Chapel Hill Street Development, and uh, the site is within the city's jurisdiction. The present designation of the site is Commercial Infill and Residential Urban 52. And the request is to commercial general with a development plan and to commercial infill with a development plan. Total site is 2.7 acres and the proposed use is for a total of 50,000 square feet of commercial office or residential uses. Uh, you have seen this case in, in February as Ms. Woods mentioned uh, under a, a different case number. The difference between that case and this case before you this evening is the addition of 0.44 acres um, which is essentially existing as commercial infill currently. They're adding it to the development plan associated with this site um, for, for, for CI to CID. Um, the remainder of the site, which is currently CI and RU52, which is 2.26 acres, is proposed to go to commercial general with the development plan. The site is at the corner of Kent Street and West Chapel Hill Street, as shown on this context map, it is in the urban tier. It's a total of nine parcels. The original uh, request uh, was seven parcels. Uh, the development plan associated with this request meets the minimum criteria of our uh, unified development ordinance for both the commercial general district and the commercial infill district, and this information is in the staff report. The existing conditions of the site uh, are shown here. Uh, there are a couple structures on the site currently. Three existing structures I um, understand to be vacant and one is a commercial dorm. Uh, th there is uh, undeveloped property to the rear which is largely the RU52 zoning presently and there is a uh, city parking lot um, to the east of the street frontage on West Chapel Hill Street. The proposal as shown here is your development plan which um, meets the minimum criteria and shows graphic commitments and there are text commitments associated with this which I'll go over. Um, shows, uh, meets, meets our standards here. There's three site access points, one pedestrian access point to the rear here with Carol Alley. Um, there's commitments and I'll go over these in a little more detail for walls in the rear, a fence with pedestrian access, a total of 50,000 square feet of uh, use area, 39,000 square feet is designated to be on the commercial general portion which is this larger portion of the site and 11,000 uh, square feet is, is allowable for the commercial infill portion. So here are some of the equipment. 
uh, trying to summarize them. There are 50,000 square feet of non-residential uses. There's three access points. Uh, um, two are on the sh uh, road frontages to Kent Street and West Chapel Hill Street. The pedestrian only access point is shown connecting to um, Carroll Alley to the rear. And the impervious surface maximum is 100%. Um, there's some graphic commitments as well. The lo location of the access points, the, there's a minimum seven foot wood fence shown in two sections, there's the pedestrian opening, the seven foot masonry screen wall minimum. Uh, the maximum height is, is limited to two stories for both the CI, uh, D and the CGD portion with the CGD portion being limited to 52 feet. Um, normally it could go to 50 feet in that area has been reduced to 42 with this proposal. And there's a limitation on uses that I'll try to clarify for you. Uh, the, if the CGD portion of the site is committed to be limited to the CI uses with the addition of some drive-through facilities, which could be a bank or a pharmacy, um, but it's also restricted uh, that uses in the CGD portion cannot be vehicle service, nightclub, bar, outdoor kennel, or freestanding wireless facility. And that any use in the CGD district that would have required a use permit in the CI district is not permitted. With the CID portion, there's some limitations as well, which uh, there uh, are restricting the presence of freestanding wireless facilities. Uh, the te there are uh, three text commitments that the seven foot a minimum seven foot masonry screen wall for the dumpster and recycling uh, shall be screened with the masonry wall in addition to the plantings. There are some transit facilities that are committed uh, along West Chapel Hill Street and that there shall be no illuminated building signage to the rear uh, building facades. There's uh, design commitments here which uh, provide details of, of architectural elements uh, the describing the roof line as well as providing details for building materials. And as Ms. Woods uh, presented to you, a portion of the site is not uh, consistent with the future land use map of the comprehensive plan. The rear is uh, shown as medium density residential, which would allow 8 to 12, 20 units an acre. Um, and the, the frontage of the site is consistent with the commercial designation. This request does satisfy and meet the requirements of all the comprehensive plan policies with the exception of the future land use map. And staff determines that if the plan amendment is approved, this request um, uh, is, would be consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies. Please excuse the typo. I'll reread, um, re-state uh, that uh, in, Correctly, the staff determines that should the plan amendment be approved, this request would be consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Thank you. Thank you. I have nine people signed up to speak. I want to make sure we didn't overlook anyone. If you're wishing to speak, uh, actually the nine people that's here, and excuse me if I butcher your last name. You have uh, we got Micah Korsmeyer, Orkin Check, maybe. Or, or sorry. Yes. Um, there's a two Johnsons, um, the Ecker, was it Stasso, Brown, Calhoun, and a Mitchell. Did I miss anyone? Yeah. So if you're speaking in favor of, um, if you can come over here, you have ten minutes. So that's like a little over a minute each, unless you want to combine your time. So if you guys can just start and we'll take it from there. Yes. In favor of. All, all, all nine are in favor of, yes. 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 Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the, the speakers on the proponent side will speak in the order in which they're lined up, if that's okay. okay. Thank you. Um, good evening. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Micah Kordsmeyer, and I work with the real estate team at Self Help, which is the owner of the applicant Chapel Hill Street development. Uh, when, we, when we came before this commission in February, 
We heard the need to work together with the neighborhoods to put forward a development plan. We've worked hard since then to put together a set of commitments that formalize our long-standing commitment to further the community's vision for redevelopment along West Chapel Hill Street. Self-help has a history of work in surrounding neighborhoods such as the West End and Lion Park. With our partners, Self-Help created and manages an affordable housing land bank that has supported the creation of 125 units of high quality affordable housing by partners such as the Durham Community Land Trustees and Habitat for Humanity. That base of affordable housing ensures that economic development on this street will be inclusive and that the area will remain a diverse community accessible to all. Beginning last October, we've participated in at least 39 face-to-face -face meetings listening closely to area residents and business owners at anything from community-wide public meetings to neighborhood association picnics and West End living rooms. We've spent hours on the phone with many that are here tonight, participated in neighborhood listservs and distributed flyers door-to-door. -door. By our count, we've heard from over 200 people throughout the area neighborhoods in the course of this process. A neighborhood advisory committee guided us on the commitments represented on the development plan before you tonight. This group included the Neighborhood Association presidents of the West End, Birch Avenue, and Moorhead Hill, as well as the West Chapel Hill Street Merchants Association and the Quality of Life Project of Southwest Central Durham. In addition, we continue meeting with residents and neighborhood groups to study additional ways to improve the project. We are proud of the public process that informed our plans for this development and the commitments contained in this zoning application. We look forward to helping realize a community vision expressed through years of neighborhood planning efforts for a revitalized commercial district on West Chapel Hill Street. Thank you for your time. Good evening. My name is Elisa Johnson. I'm a Birch Avenue resident and the chair of the Southwest Central Durham Quality of Life Project. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. For over 20 years, the neighborhoods of Birch Avenue, the West End, Lion Park, and West Chapel Hill Street Merchants Association and scores of others have committed themselves to the economic re revitalization of West Chapel, Chapel Hill Street. Self-Help's Kent Corner Project is a wonderful first step. The proposed commercial space will bring new goods and services to the surrounding neighborhoods, invite new customers to already established businesses, and provide, among other things, an open space for community gatherings. Self-help has a strong reputation in our neighborhoods, having developed a number of affordable housing and been an integral part in the creation of the Pauli Murray Place and the Maplewood Senior Apartments. QOL is proud to stand with the many individuals, neighborhood associations, and groups who have endorsed this project and zoning proposal. These include the West, uh, West Chapel Hill Street Merchants Association, the Moorhead Hill, Birch Avenue, and Tuscaloosa Lakewood Neighborhood Associations, and the former president of the West End Neighborhood Association. At this point, I would like to encourage those people who have come to support the project and the proposal in person to stand with me, if you would please. Thank you. My name is Loris Oroskevich. I'm a resident of Birch Avenue in Moorhead Hills now for 28 years. I'm here to represent Kent Corner Task Force. And for those of you who are not familiar with what our group is, we were a grassroots neighborhood organization that became very interested in this project. Um, to make sure that uh, there was a development plan submitted. Um, we were the first ones to press for one, to ask for one, and we really appreciated your support at the February 12th meeting when you suggested to self-help with the rezoning case that there should be a development plan. Um, we are happy to report that we have been working with self-help. We're grateful for them meeting with us, and we have been working to refine certain points that Ms. Wolf had uh, mentioned. Uh, to make this development as best as it can be, to be neighborhood friendly, to assure us that it will be a precedent for the type of commercial and retail development we would like to see on West Chapel Hill Street, for which we fought so hard with all the charrettes to create the CI infill. And even if it is going to be rezoned, we want to be assured that the spirit of that intention will be uh, preserved. So we thank you for your time and for your support and we are for this project. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Thank you for having me before you this evening. My name is Nicholas Hawthorne Johnson. 
I am a, a resident of Birch Avenue neighborhood. Uh, I also own The Cookery, which is a business on West Chapel Hill Street, and I am the co-chair of the West Chapel Hill Street Merchants Association. Um, I'm here to express uh, the support of the Merchants Association as well as my own personal support for this project. Uh, I'm very excited, I think we all are, at the, um, the potential that this project um, unleashes in the, in the neighborhood. Um, the, the key things I think that are important to pay attention to are um, that this development will bring to the area new people to the, that, that will be there working all day needing services which provides an opportunity for existing businesses like my own as well as additional businesses to occupy the now unoccupied uh, commercial area along the West Chapel Hill Street corridor. Um, the green space uh, proposed in the project allows for a place for people to gather together um, and that in general having these buildings not be standing there vacant but rather filled with uh, a vibrant uh, workforce uh, day in and day out uh, will provide a greater degree of public safety for all of us in the neighborhood which we all dearly want. Um, the only additional thing I wanted to add to that is, uh, actually I think that might do it. Um, thank you very much. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me and allowing me to speak. I'm Frank Stacio. I reside at 4805 American Drive, and I'm here tonight representing the board of directors of the Durham Central Market. And I'm going to ask you to recommend that the city council approve this rezoning request. If this request is granted, I am very confident that within 18 months and probably sooner, we will have a full service natural foods grocery store as part of this project and not only will this 10,000 square foot grocery store provide access to natural foods, it's also going to provide jobs, job training, it's going to provide uh, a gathering space for community and it's also a catalyst for further development along the Chapel Hill Street corridor. We have firm commitments for more than $1.2 million in financing, and we expect to have the full amount that we need in hand very soon. We've got a lot of excitement among our owners and our members. We have more and more owner members every day. And right now we have 1,150 owner members, and as I say, more and more every day. All, almost all of them Durham residents, very excited about this project, very excited about the possibility of natural food, natural food access, community development, and community gathering space. Our board of directors is here tonight, and I know you've seen the, the, the full number of supporters, but I want to single out the board of directors of the Durham Central Market, if you would please stand. Thank you very much. And they're showing their support. I want to thank you for your time, and I ask you again for your support to recommend approval to the city council. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Selena Mack. I'm the Executive Director of Durham Community Land Trustees, and I'm here tonight to um, present a board resolution in support of the zoning map change for the Kent um, Corner pr 2 project. Um, specifically, it reads that whereas Durham Community Land Trustees is a community-based nonprofit organization with a mission to develop permanently affordable housing for low and moderate income families, and whereas the location of the proposed Kent Corner project 2 project is within Durham Community Land Trustee's primary development target area of Durham's West End neighborhoods. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Directors of Durham Community Land Trustees is in support of the zoning map change request um, of the Chapel Hill Street Development LLC um, for medium density to commercial in order um, to support the proposed Kent Corner project. Thank you. Sir, before you start, I doubt you can be able to get it done in 53 seconds. So what I'm going to ask for is a motion to suspend the rules to allow you two additional minutes. Uh, unless you I, think you I can get it I appreciate it. I don't think I can do it because I'm not going to read the whole letter. I'm just going to say who I'm representing and pass the letter on to you if that's okay. Oh, so you can get it done in 53 seconds? Yes, sir. Oh, even better. Okay, <laughs> carry on. Sorry. I, I also, I, board, uh, I chair the Durham Community Land Trust Board, so I know how to run a good meeting. So, uh, My name is Mark Eckert. I live at 506 Gaddis Street. Uh, I'm here representing the Birch Avenue Neighborhood Association on behalf of Isaac Price, who could not make it tonight. I have in my hand a letter uh, approved by the board of the Birch Avenue Neighborhood Association uh, fully in support of this zoning re um, rezoning application. Uh, we conducted a poll in our neighborhood 
uh, and over 97 percent of the respondents uh, supported this this uh, move. Thank you. You can't be promised. Okay. So we if we don't have okay. Thank you, sir. If we don't have anyone else wishing to speak on this item, I'll close the public hearing and bring it back before the commissioners. Mr. Whitley. I've been following this for quite a while. North East Central Durham has taken our lead from West Durham. Um, and um, little did I know that one day I will be here to, to be able to vote on this. I, um, I would recommend to, to my fellow commissioners that, um, that you approve this item and move Durham forward. Thank you. Yes, sir, Mr. Gibbs. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to make a comment on uh, this area has been, as we all know, has been needing uh, what's being proposed here uh, for a long time. Everything else has been taking place on the other end of Main Street, uh, uh, Main Street and Chapel Hill Street. And this area, I think, is going to bring it up to a standard where uh, I think will benefit not only the whole, not only this community, but as a, another gateway into downtown. I especially like the, the curve of the proposed building, and I've already spoken to some of the designers, and, and I, I'm just a... Uh, a real nut for unique architecture. Uh, but that said, I do have a question about the, uh, the proposed uh, community, uh, oh, what was it that you called the community store? Uh, I, I, I forgot who was there, but uh, yes. Uh, will this only serve the community or are there plans for it to have uh, to be able to supply a wider area uh, of downtown or anywhere that you wanted to bring in more customers? Yeah, the grocery store is available to everyone and though it's a cooperatively owned grocery store, um, anybody can shop there. So you, you would buy a membership, and if you're familiar with the Weaver Street Co-op, it operates on the same model. But anybody can shop there. So this becomes, uh, this becomes a store that is available uh, and allows natural food access to everybody. And, and it would be stocked to, to do that. that yeah, it's a full-service grocery store, so sure, you would have... That's, that's the term I was looking for, full service. Yes, yeah. sir. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other commissioners wishing to speak? Can we get a motion? I move approval. Say it again. Say it again. I move approval. Second. Okay. So I moved and properly second. All those in favor, let it be known by saying. Actually, can you read the? Move read? approval of A1200017, plan amendment. Can we get another second to make it official? Second. Okay. The moved and properly second. All those in favor, let it be known by raising your right hand. Any opposition? Motion carries 12 to 0. I just, I just want to clarify um, just for the record that there's no commitment for a specific use. There's just restrictions on uses and what would be allowed. So the representation of a grocery store, which may in what fact happen, is not a commitment of the plan. I just want to make that clear. Can we get Mr. a chair? I move yes, zoning case number Z1300007. Okay. So, was a moving properly second? All those in favor, let it be known by raising your right hand. Okay. Any opposition? Motion carries 12 to 0. All right. Thank you. We want to thank the residents of the city for coming out and supporting um, your community. We always like for residents to come out and support. Thank you. 
Okay, we'll move down to item 6A, Carolina Crossing 2, that's case Z120004. Thank you, Amy Wolf with the Planning Department again. This case is for Carolina Crossing 2, case Z120004. The applicant is Earth Centric Engineering. This case is within the city's jurisdiction. The present uh, designation is residential suburban 20 and the request is to zone to office institutional with a development plan. The site is 5.033 acres and the proposal is for a two for two multi-story medical office buildings uh, 84,000 square feet each and I'll elaborate on that just a little bit uh, further. Uh, the site is located at 5936 Farringdon Road near the intersection of Interstate 40 and NC 54 Highway. Uh, this site uh, is within the FJB watershed protection overlay and the um, major transportation corridor overlay of I-40. It is in the city's jurisdiction. It's the suburban tier and the suburban transit area. This request and the development plan meets the requirements of the Unified Development Ordinance for the Office Institutional District as shown here. Uh, this is the existing conditions of the site. There is presently a place of worship on the site uh, near the frontage of, on Farringdon Road with access from Cleora. It, it has, it's a place of worship with parking and um, some a cleared uh, towards the uh, away from Far uh, Farringdon Road. The proposed development plan is shown here. It does show the requirements and meet the minimum standards for a development plan. Uh, it shows the site with uh, the building and parking envelope, uh, the access points, and uh, for this particular request in the suburban transit area, uh, it's required for a phasing plan. So phase one will be to the rear. Phase two will, will be where the existing place of worship is located. And there's some commitments associated with this and I'll elaborate. Um, minimally, it will allow for 168,000 square feet of use area at, in, in addition to 192,000 square feet of a, for a parking structure. There are seven access points located and shown on the development plan and the impervious surface maximum would be 70%, which is the maximum permissible in the watershed protection overlay. There are some graphic commitments that include the location of access points, and the applicant is committing to developing per the compact neighborhood tier standards, which essentially um, creates de design standards that um, pull the buildings toward the street uh, with with smaller, set, um, excuse me, they include a maximum setback as opposed to a minimum setback. There's a couple text commitments as well. Prior to the for issuance of a certificate of, of occupancy, there's some road improvements um, uh, at NC54 and Farrington Road, Farrington Road, Farrington Road and Cloyora Drive, as well as across access driveway. And additionally, four feet of additional pay, uh, asphalt along Farrington Road for a bicycle lane, which uh, satisfies a condition uh, in our long-range bicycle plan. There's a number of design commitments that are separated for the, the, the buildings, uh, which are encompassed in the 168,000 square feet of building use. As shown here, it shows building um, uh, materials, architecture elements, uh, and um, window design, these are all in the staff report as well as on the development plan in the staff report. And also the parking deck uh, has its own set of design commitments uh, which show some uh, architectural elements and detailing that the applicant is proffering. The request is consistent with our future land use map as shown here, it's office, it's adjacent to a commercial node at um, the I-40, Farringdon Road and 54 um, intersections. And it is also consistent with the other applicable policies of our comprehensive plan. And for that reason, staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted policies and ordinances.
Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have four people signed, well, six people signed up to speak for, four, four, and two against. So if you're wishing to speak, uh, we have Mr. Tom uh, Stark, Phil Koch, Chris Howlett, and Earl um, Llewellyn. It looks like about two and a half minutes each. That's okay. Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll do most of the speaking. I'm oh. Tom Stark. I represent the developer LRC5. Um, Phil Cook is the site engineer. He's available here for questions. Uh, Earl Llewellyn is the traffic engineer. Uh, Mr. Hallett is uh, one of the managers of the developer and are all availa are available for questions. Um, this is an exciting project. It, um, we believe it meets exactly the, what uh, is intended in the comprehensive plan. Um, you've heard the staff report and um, the, uh, the uh, engineers have worked carefully with staff to come forward with a plan that uh, meets the requirements. It's uh, designed for two medical office buildings of 68,000 square feet each uh, with structured parking. Uh, one building will front on Cleora Drive and one building will front on Farrington Road. That will be built separate as Farrington Road Baptist Church is currently on that parcel. It's a five acre parcel. Um, the developer is concerned about the traffic in the area and so there have been, um, have worked with uh, both the uh, city um, traffic department, um, uh, traffic engineering and uh, also the DOT and are making almost a million dollars in road improvements um, including two left turn lanes coming south on Farrington Road, um, turn lane into Cleora, uh, a left turn and right turn coming out of Cleora which is the, the street just north of um, 54 that uh, abuts the project. Uh, there'll be a right turn lane from 54 into North Farrington Road. There'll be a right turn lane on westbound 54 to South Farrington Road. There'll be an extended left turn lane from westbound uh, 54 onto Farrington Road. Um, you know, since the, the school was built in that area, there had been some additional traffic. We think that this will help clear some of that. Um, you see the level of service that uh, is contained in the city staff report and uh, we're well within the guidelines and uh, so we're, we're proud of that uh, facet. Um, a lot of this traffic that is going through this, this section of road, we have served Chapel Hill for a long time in Durham from the I-4054 uh, interchange towards Chapel Hill. Um, a lot of this traffic will be stopping short at these buildings. Um, that intersection has uh, developed a number of medical clinics and, and this is designed for medical office use. Um, it will allow a substantial development that will add to the tax base in Durham County and employment in Durham County. Um, we've, uh, the developer has done a, a, a wonderful job and Earl Llewellyn here is here can talk about more about it uh, in establishing the traffic. Um, architecturally, the, the project will be brick and concrete columns with arches and um, aluminum window uh, walls in between, uh, again with brick. Um, it's being designed by the same architect that designed a uh, almost 40,000 square foot building on the adjacent track. Uh, so we believe that it will be consistent in its appearance. Uh, the buildings across the street are brick. Um, uh, office buildings. Um, so we think that um, this project offers Durham a, a very attractive um, uh, project that will um, help Durham out. I um, feel like we've addressed the issues uh, concerning it and so we'd urge your approval of the uh, map change. The map, um, most of the area uh, around there was planned to be uh, office. Uh, this is a church site so it, so it can exist in any zoning and so it remained um, RS-20. So if there are any questions I'll be happy to try to answer them or call up one of the experts who can give you the detail. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We have two people signed up. Again. And I'll reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal if necessary. Okay. Thank you, sir. So we have two people who are signed up for against us, uh, Chris Shelby and Holly Shen. 
and you, you have five minutes each. Hi, I'm Chris Selby. I live at 138 Celeste Circle. I brought a map indicating <clears throat> our Celeste Circle in our neighborhood of Eastwood Park here, which you just saw uh, illustrated as a commercial hub. Actually, it's a residential neighborhood and the recent NC54 I-40 corridor study recommended that our long-term land use be residential. Uh, in relation to our neighborhood is NC54 here, Farrington Road, I-40, and the site in question is here. Uh, I had three points I'd like to bring up. One has to do with uh, the imper uh, this project here, which is uphill from us. And with all the impervious service, surface being uh, planned, we're concerned about runoff and flooding, such as what happened last week and had impact on homes and automobiles. It seems uh, that there is a possibility, uh, considering that Falcon Bridge Mall over here uh, drains under NC-54 into our neighborhood, it should be possible to drain this the other way, under Farrington Road, away from us. Or possibly we have a uh, third world drainage system uh, provided by the city of Durham. It's possible they could upgrade our storm sewer system in our neighborhood. In any event, the handout that was provided offers no indication of what they want to do with, uh, with uh, uh, drainage. The second point is uh, traffic. Uh, traffic will exit onto Farrington Road and enter and exit and enter onto the service road. Over 2,000 trips a day will go via the service road. Now, the idea of using this service road for increased levels of traffic was brought up during the uh, uh, collector street plan meeting several years back and the planners in, from Durham said that that was a very bad idea since this service road is very close to NC 54 traffic flow when there's increased traffic would be impeded by this closeness and it would be dangerous so you don't want to increase traffic flow on here and they want to increase it by over 2,000 trips a day and this is a local street and I'd like to invite the uh, commission members to who live on a local street to consider whether they would uh, approve a project that would bring about over 2,000 trips a day to their neighborhood street. And thirdly, uh, an adjacent project was brought to this commission a couple years ago, or a few years ago, from the same applicant, and it is near completion. One of the commissioners asked in conjunction with that project, if they would fix a problem here at this corner of Celeste and the service road in which there's a telephone pole right in the middle of the sidewalk. The applicant agreed to do that, but that has not been fixed. Nothing's been done. So I, I would consider it reasonable not to proceed until that's fixed. So to summarize, there were three issues I'd like to bring up. Uh, is the large amount of impervious surface which is likely to lead to increased frequency and severity of flooding to our neighborhood and the absence of any way to deal with that. Uh, the poor traffic plan and the uh, credibility of the applicant. Thank you. I'm Hallie Shin, and I am also here with some questions about this project. Um, I own property directly behind the um, proposed building, and two of my concerns echo um, my neighbors. Um, one of them is the environmental impact of all this impervious surface. Um, my property is directly behind, as I said, and the, as he said, the runoff comes straight behind the church's property through my property. There's a natural stream um, behind the three properties that are, excuse me, immediately behind the um, Cleora property. And the nat so the natural break is down there and I am very concerned about the runoff from all this parking space coming straight through my property. 
Um, my second concern is the traffic and thinking that a couple of turn lanes are going to ameliorate the nightmare of traffic on Farrington is, it's, I think it's a fantasy. It's a nightmare to drive on Farrington. I invite any of you to travel that road during rush hours and see just what a log jam it is. It's a couple of turn lanes is not going to increase access. And I'm surprised that they wouldn't suggest a stoplight because Cleora is impossible to get into and especially out of. Um, and my third concern is, as I mentioned, my property is right behind there and <laughs> this is a selfish concern, but I, having this giant structure right in front of three property owners, um, I, I don't understand the rationale for like piecemeal OI zoning this area and then stranding this little pocket of our, my neighbors and myself back behind this structure. It's, I mean, I hate to think what it's gonna do to my property value to be tucked in behind this parking garage. And you know, when we bought the house, 12, 13 years ago, we were like, oh, it's nice, there's a church there, but I guess that's, that's not. So yes, yeah, so my concerns are the runoff, going to the stream behind our house, the horrible parking and uh, traffic, and then <laughs> looking at this huge brick building. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll close the public hearing and bring it back before the commissioners. I have Mr. Davis signed up. Well, I wanted to speak first. If there's anyone else, oh, yes. uh, my question is for staff. Um, I know my memory serves me. There was an NC 54 corridor study, and it seems like in this vicinity they talk about a parking garage that would serve UNC Chapel Hill commuters. Was there any look at you know that study? I know there's a phasing plan, but how that would be affected if this uh, zoning request was approved? We, it, as part of our review, we did consult that plan. Um, it, it, in the staff report, I think it's identified this area as residential one, which essentially was multifamily, and I think as well, as you mentioned, a parking garage. Um, council never formally adopted that plan, so we have no leverage or um, uh, mechanism to request things as part of the development plan, but we did look at the plan and, and included what we found in the staff report. Thank you. Commissioner Board. Um, I was present at a neighborhood meeting for this project quite some time ago, and there was extensive opposition to it, largely on the grounds of um, not paying a whole lot of attention to the NC-54 corridor study and uh, the uh, very severe traffic issues with it. So it's very interesting to me that basically nothing ever came of that. This appears to be the same plan as we got then. Um, I certainly was not pleased with the impervious surface, but my biggest concern is traffic. In spite of how bad this intersection is, I, the applicant did not choose to provide us with a map of what these changes would be to the area, what the intersections looked like. I attempted to make my own. It's almost impossible to read. <laughs> what looks like the intersection of Highway 54 and the interstate, no, that's Farrington and Highway 54. Uh, what should be a nice little two-lane road crossing a four-lane highway is just insane. The addition of two extra, the, the two leftover lanes, let me back up a moment. A lot of what was proposed as enhancements, not to make this intersection work well, but to not make it any worse than an LOSD, which it already is. There's no improvements here. There's holding ground at barely above failing. <laughs> um, so one of the things that's on here is two leftover lanes to get on um, I-40. My concern there is that this, is so, this intersection is so close to I-40 that if one doesn't already know the intersection extremely well and gets in the wrong one of the left turn lanes, you're not going to be able to make that quick zigzag in a safe way. You're going to have a crash right there just trying to change lanes. Um, when you pull on to Highway 54 from 
I-40 going towards Chapel Hill. There's a proposal of an extra lane to turn on to Farrington. Sounds nice, except that that intersection, that little corner right there that is dangerous because so many people have to turn on the Highway 54 and then immediately cross three lanes of traffic because they want to turn left on Farrington. Now we're adding a lane to that. So that's not really helping anything either. Um, the only one of the road improvements that I think people in the area would find attractive is lengthening the turn lane from 54 onto the left turn up onto Farrington going north. Um, and even the DOT and their comments, you know, they're like, say flat out, this is not going to repair the intersection. This is not going to bring it up to an acceptable standard of service. It just holds it at just above failing. <laughs> Why are we spending all of this money on something that does not match what the Highway 54 corridor study suggested for this area? And we're just making things worse. We don't need this. Thank you. Commissioner Beachwood. I'd have to ditto the concerns of uh, the previous commissioners regarding both the transportation um, options and the um, basic disregard of, of the NC-54 plan. Um, I have a question for the developer. I would like to know if they met and how many meetings they held with the community. I believe there was one large meeting with the community. One large meeting? Do you know how many people were there? Um, I don't remember exactly now, uh, 30 or 40, maybe. Okay. 40 or 50, I'm told. Thank you. Uh, when was that? Sure. Um, that was in the summer of 2012, I believe, wasn't it? Thank you. And uh, could I address some of the transportation issues? Sure. Um, with respect to the left turn lanes, uh, that will be on a signal, and so you'll have two lanes turning left other than right turns coming off of 54 south. Um, those two lanes will be able to travel relatively unimpeded onto 54. Um, in, in addition, what that does is the double lanes, one of the problems now is the lanes stack up so far back up Farrington Road, where th this cuts that down. So it will dramatically improve that. The right turn lane coming off of westbound 54 from the 54 ramp over to Farrington Road, that will allow people that are coming off that ramp that want to get to Farrington Road to simply circle around without entering the through traffic. It then leaves three open through lanes. There's still a difficult lane movement from the ramp to going south on Farrington Road, but that's not traffic generated in any way by this project. And, it, it, you know, this developer was not in a position to try to fix that. Um, the right turn lane going westbound, uh, eastbound on 54 to Farrington Road will peel off some of the traffic earlier and give you an additional through lane at the 54 intersection. So there are actually a number of things that are going to really make a lot of the uh, movements easier. The right turn lane on 54, uh, uh, East, westbound from Farrington Road North um, will uh, leave a through lane going south to Farrington Road and a dedicated turn lane that will dump that traffic onto 54. So all of those will greatly improve all those movements. And with respect to the drainage, the, um, the, the engineers have worked uh, long and hard with uh, with uh, very sophisticated draining features, and that's part of site plan analysis. This is just looking at the map, but um, th that will be a uh, substantial drainage feature that will handle uh, those waters, and that will be part of the approval at the site plan stage. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Mr. Padgett. We seem to keep getting a lot of these cases where traffic seems to be a problem. Well, surprise, we're in Durham. Tell me where we can go between the hours of 7 and 9 in the morning or 5 and 7 and not see traffic. So if we gauge everything we approve or disapprove based on traffic, tax base in Durham will be flatlined. We won't see anything coming to Durham, 
and we'll do the typical thing. We'll run everything to other communities and other counties. And there are places throughout the state that are begging, begging for increasing tax bases and developments, trying to get into the game of where we can get people back to work. Um, we unfortunately, um, these locations can't get that. And we're inundated with it. But at the same time, we need a tax base and things can only get better. They can't get any worse. So we need to look at things that will help Durham increase that tax base. And I don't think we need to hinge it. It's just another case of, yeah, we want it, we want it, we want it. It's like affordable housing. We want it, we want it, oops, not in my backyard. So I think we really have to look at these projects and decide what's good for the community. And it may not be a popular position, but sometimes you just got to make the decision and move forward. So, you know, I'm going to support the project. Everyone has spoken, yes? Okay, Dr. Winders. I have a, a question uh, and about the, um, uh, the cross access driveway, uh, maybe I missed that, but would you explain how that's going to work? Somebody? <laughs> there will never not be a number of cross access, access points to the track to the south of this track, and uh, it would allow uh, a person to go from that uh, property to the south over to the parking on this. Uh, property or onto the upper level of the deck, probably. And that will send it to the service road, or is it going to go all the way through to 54? It will go to either to the service road, and it'll cross, and it will allow people on that property to cross across to Cleor and go out through the the new road improvements. And to go out Farrington. Yes. Road. Yeah. So, th uh, so that rather than taking all the traffic that's on the track to the south, this will allow that traffic to to continue up to Cleora and out um, on the new turn lanes and so forth that have been constructed. So something that uh, concerns me about the, um, uh, the, the traffic projections is the large amount of, of land that is zoned office, you know, in, in this area. And here we're, we're using up, I think we're already at 107% of 54 and, and our criteria are we can't go above 110, so that doesn't leave much room for anybody else. And along Farrington, I think we're at about 94%. So, you know, by approving a large development on one of these pieces of, of property, we're saying to the neighboring landowners, uh, you know, that they're not going to be able to develop until we build a new road. Everyone else has spoken? All right. So we have Mr. Gibbs, and once everyone has spoken, we'll give the commissioners one more round. That's okay? So, yes, sir. Well, I, transportation is always an issue, uh, and, and I agree with all the comments uh, uh, from all the commissioners. Uh, it's one of those things where there doesn't seem to be a good solution other than getting DOT involved uh, and making some large-scale uh, improvements to the main thoroughfares uh, serving these areas. Uh, we always have to do these things piecemeal, as we all know, and, and, and we just have to do what's, what will help the certain little areas, but I do I do have one question that I'd like to have uh, I don't know who to, to who to direct it to. Uh, is there a storm water system in this area? Where does the storm water go to? Uh, do we have storm sewers? Uh, My name is Phil Cuck with Earthcentric Engineering. Um, there is minimal stormwater currently in that that particular area that serves this property 
One thing that needs to be understood is that Durham has very stringent stormwater requirements. So during the design process, one of the requirements is that we would not be able to allow water to run off at a faster rate during the 10 year storm event than currently is running off at, at this time. And typically we do do a pretty good job of also trying to handle the 100 year storm during that design period. So the, the truth is, is that as far as the stormwater management issue, that's a requirement at Durham standards already. So uh, the effects of this development regarding stormwater would be minimized by your current standards for design. Yeah, and all of these things do have a, a cumulative effect and I, and I, uh, I feel for the, the presentation earlier where there were some comments made about the runoff and how it's going to how it's going to affect their area. This this happens in this part of the county all the time. Uh, I don't know what the answer is, but we just have to do the best we can. And if it meets uh, the standards, then uh, well, we'll just see how the vote goes tonight. And I. Uh, Thank you for your comments. Mr. Smutsky. Uh, thank you. Uh, I did want to ask uh, how, you know, I didn't see any plans. So is there a stormwater basin in, in the plans? Again, that, that is something that would be worked out during the design stage, but, but we will be required to control stormwater runoff and that would likely require a basin. Okay, and I, I think I remember seeing 70% in previous service? 70% is the maximum available on the site. That is correct. And that's what you're planning? It, we've, we've listed as it to allow the most flexibility within the design. Okay. We have listed at 70%. So the, and, and the big brick buildings, uh, they're 84,000 square feet. Is that... How many floors? That, that's seven floors per building. Seven floors per building. That's correct. Okay. Um, all right, so, great. How many, uh, the footprint of that, how many acres? I, it's 12,000 square feet per, per floor. Okay, 12,000 square feet. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so we do have the stormwater runoff, and my big concern, again, like other members was the traffic but i uh, i was impressed that the developers were willing to spend a million dollars to try to address the traffic situation that that they're that they're influencing but they're also trying to ameliorate the situation on off on off-site traffic patterns so um I think uh, Commissioner Gibbs is right that we need to get the Department of Transportation involved and maybe our, our local city uh, planners and see what we can do about this situation. And I think I think this is I think approval of this request would bring pressure to bear that you know, this that something needs to be done at this situation. All right. Thank you. Uh, I have a few questions myself. So we alluded to the 54 out of 40 study. My question is, since city council hadn't adopted that plan yet, and in the, in the event they do adopt the plan, what does this section now look like? If this was to be approved on top of the I-40, 54 study. Bill Judge, City of Durham, Department of Transportation. The 54 I-40 corridor study was adopted by the MPO, which includes members from um, Durham City Council, Durham County Commissioners, uh, Chapel Hill, Carborough, other uh, elected officials. So um, with transportation plans, those individual plans do not go to those individual bodies. It does go to the, to the MPO and it has been adopted by that. So at this point that plan is, is finalized and considered an adopted plan. Okay, so implementation of that plan juxtaposed Im to yeah. this. What implementation are we of that plan would go through the various funding mechanisms we use for all transportation projects. Uh, the NC 54 and I-40 are both state roads, so 
It'll primarily be funded through the NCDOT TIP project. The, uh, the, as a matter of fact, the very first recommendation out of that was for a slip ramp from 54, I mean from Farrington, across 54 onto I-40 so that if someone's coming north on Farrington, they can get directly on 54 eastbound. Um, that project's qualified for some mobility funding and um, could be under, hopefully under construction within probably the next two years, depending on um, yeah, the actual um, design and any utility relocations. But so that, that's the very first small piece or phase of that project. The larger pieces have to do with uh, transit funding and the, the future Durham Orange Light Rail Transit as well as um, conjunction with land use and other development and um, just availability of statewide funding through the TIP project and how this ranks. Right. So in short, yeah. if we took a, I guess, a GIS analysis and we did some layers of what this plan looks like on top of the 54 and on top of the additional road improvements, there's enough land and enough buffering there to satisfy both of them at the same time without causing, I guess without yeah. making the situation any worse is probably the better question. Correct. The 54 corridor study tries to redirect a lot of the traffic from Farrington Road through a collector street system um, where it would connect the 54 um, further towards Chapel Hill, towards the west, I guess. Um, and um, so, I mean, as those collector streets are built, um, that would hopefully, hopefully divert some of the traffic to the more appropriate intersections and locations. But so far as the footprint of the 54 Farrington Road interchange in this proposed development, I'm not aware of any conflicts with the proposed development plan that would be in conflict with the future plans for the 54 I-40 corridor study. Okay, so at full build out, do you think it'd be best suited for that area well, in your professional yeah I mean I'll let other judgment. folks determine on on land use but so far as you know the, the actual building locations um, yeah the there is no additional right-of-way or corridors or or things that are that are needed to accommodate the the recommendations of the 54 corridor study okay so. all right so I think we had two more. Ms. Board, you want to speak in Ms. Beachwood. So what we'll do, we'll give, we'll give them a minute each. Is that, is that okay? We'll give them a minute each to give their closing remarks. Um, well, just based on what I've heard, it's going to be messy if, with the 54 study. If that would just be built out at 100%, it's, the construction phase is going to be very, very messy. And it looks like this project is going to be very, very messy. But from what I'm understanding is at the completion of both projects, that section of Durham would be a much better section. That's what I'm understanding. We just have to go through the messy stages of making this actually come to fruition. So I'll let Ms. Uh, Board go and Ms. Beachwood and we'll have a motion after that. Um. Some comments tonight have made me clear, made me aware that I'm more familiar with the transportation issues in this corridor than some of the other people here are. I've been watching it a lot closer, a lot longer. And what you may not realize is how much time and effort has gone into the planning of not just transportation, but also growth in this area to try to ensure that where the growth is and where the traffic is work together. The Highway 54 corridor study was not merely about how to point the cars around. It was also about where do we grow given the traffic constraints? How do we move the traffic away, but also where to concentrate the growth? We've got the light rail corridor going through here. We have a future major transportation hub going in a little ways north of this project, but too far north for anybody to actually walk to it. Um, we've got the collector street plan. and. I think it was very clear, and I appreciate your comments, that the actual footprint of the buildings on the site are not in conflict with the Highway 54 corridor study. However, the improvements to this intersection are completely different. So basically, we'd be paying, the builder would have to pay to tear up the intersection, inconvenience everybody to put all those enhancements in, and then if they ever actually build the Highway 54 corridor study, changes to this intersection 
we would have to start over and redo a whole lot of it. So the building would not have to change, but the road would have to change a second time. Okay. Ms. Beachwood. The NC-54 um, corridor study was conducted over, I think, a period of four or five years. They were intensely studied area, a, a tremendous amount of energy, effort, and expertise was poured into the study of this area, including the transportation at the corner in question. But the piece that, that really um, I can't see a change for is there's no real good compelling reason for us to change it from what the community asked for and decided for over a five-year period, which is residential to office. I can't see any compelling reason to change it. So I will not be voting to change this zoning. Can we get a motion? If, if one is I'll make the motion that we approve the zoning change um, Z120004. Second. Second. So moved and properly second. All those in favor, let it be known by raising your right hand. All those opposed? Motion fails four to eight. Thank you. We'll move down to 6B, Cleveland Holloway, local historic district expansion update, case X, one, zero, 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 three, and Z, one, two, zero, zero, three, zero, 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 three, zero. Good evening, Commissioners. Pat Young with the Planning Department. Um, with me tonight is Sarah Young, who's at the dais, who's going to be operating a brief PowerPoint presentation, and uh, Lisa Miller. Uh, Sarah uh, and Lisa are the principal planners on the project before you tonight. We'll be taking questions on the proposal. Um, two separate actions are before you. Uh, the first is an update to the Cleveland Holloway Streets Preservation Plan, and the second is a proposed expansion of the Holloway Street local historic district. Uh, both of these uh, items, the local historic district and the preservation plan were originally adopted in 1987. And in response to a petition submitted by residents of the neighborhood uh, uh, in June of 2010, the planning department uh, undertook a survey and evaluation of the area uh, for the potential of an expansion of the district. So what's before you tonight uh, is our updates to the historic preservation plan, which include an updated inventory of structures in the district. Um, additional history, minor revisions to the local review criteria, uh, and some other minor changes that are detailed in your staff report and in the attached plan, and a proposed expanded historic district. Um, there, in fact, are two alternative uh, district boundaries that are before you. Uh, alternative A uh, would include the block face, which is made up of the 600 block of North Queen Street specifically 601, 603, and 607 North Queen Street and 308 and 310 Mallard Avenue. That's alternative A. Alternative B excludes those five properties. Uh, the Historic Preservation Commission reviewed this uh, item and recommended approval of alternative A and of the uh, update to the preservation plan in April of this year, April 4th, 2013, by a vote of five to one. Uh, and should the preservation plan uh, and the uh, either alternative A or alternative B of the expanded district boundaries be adopted. Uh, staff has found that all applicable adopted plans and ordinances uh, have been complied with and there will be no negative impact on public infrastructure, demand, or level of service. And uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you. We have... Fourteen people signed up for, and two against. So if all 14 people wanted to speak, um, that's going to be a few seconds each, unless you want to designate one person to speak for. Uh, Commissioner Jones. Yes, sir. Oh, never mind. It's a move that was suspended, but... Yeah, well, ma'am, could you come to the mic? I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. Yes, we still keep it 10 minutes, but if you want. 
We're at the pleasure of the board. If you want to suspend and let us speak a little bit, I don't think each of us is going to speak very long, um, but we could also condense the 14 who are going to speak into a smaller group, if that okay. pleases you. All right. Could you condense it to speak within 10 minutes? However, who wants to speak within 10 minutes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just however you want to line up, just come and state your name, your address, and we'll just start it from there. Good evening, Commission. Thank you for letting us speak to you for so long today. I know it's been a long day. Congratulations to the two new members. My name is Matt Dudak. I live at 502 Mallard. I moved into the neighborhood in 2008. Of, um, 2008. And uh, my partner and I, my fiance, we fixed up two houses in the neighborhood. Uh, historic tax credits have been very pivotal for allowing our neighborhood to rebound. Been an excellent economic development tool for us, and I think that this will further allow the neighborhood to grow and have some security in knowing that the investments made will uh, be safe for the, the future. I just, I'm going to speak very quickly since there's a lot of people to speak. The one thing that I want to talk about is specifically the bump out for option A versus option B. Uh, I've met Mr. Bradford, Mr. Galifianakis. I think they have um, they're good people. I think that allowing the district to bump over to that side of the road will allow extra security for allowing a co coherent idea of uh, what is the neighborhood to be across the street versus not allowing the neighborhood to have some input into what goes there. I'll see you the rest of my time to the rest of the group. Thank you for your time. Good evening. My name is Dylan Mulroney Jones, LRB. I live at 405 Ottawa Avenue, which is in the Cleveland Holloway neighborhood, about four minutes from here. I'll make my comments very brief and quick. Um, as everyone else who is in, in favor of this from the neighborhood, I am urging you to support Alternative A. I think it does a good job of including that parcel or that portion of land in um, what is a historic neighborhood full of historic homes, somewhere on the order of 75% of the homes in this neighborhood are of historic nature. Uh, obviously, what will be developed there will not be of a historic nature, but we hope that it will uh, fit within the bounds of our neighborhood um, and, and, and fit within the residential um, homes that are across the street, which are one and two story homes. Um, so I'm urging you strongly to support alternative A uh, because it's what's good for our neighborhood and it allows us in the future to have input on, on what will be developed in that area. Thank you. Hi, thank you for letting me speak. I'm Quinn Williams. I um, am a homeowner at 508 Ottawa Avenue. Um, I'm there with my husband and three children and we love being a part of this community. Um, I'm here to just to say that I strongly support Alternative A. Um, we understand that there will be a development there. We would just like something that fits within our historic community. Um, there's small, a lot of small homes, a lot of small streets with no sidewalks. Um, so I'm just in strong support of Alternative A. Thank you. Good evening, my name is John Martin. Um, I live in Old North Durham. I do not live in Cleveland Holloway. I do not have any vested interest in Cleveland Holloway. But I'm president of the Inner Neighborhood Council of Durham. And in March of 2012, the Inner Neighborhood Council did pass a resolution urging a speedier adoption of local historic districts in Durham. And here we are, July of 2013, and you see the process is extending itself. What is particularly relevant about the resolution is the first paragraph, which quoted the Durham Comprehensive Plan from 2005, which says, Durham has a wealth of historic uh, resources, many of which have been identified and designated on the National Register of Historic Places, but does not have any local protection in place to assist in the preservation of these properties. Durham should systematically identify and designate those resources in greatest need of the protection. That's exactly what this proposal tonight will do. It will protect a neighborhood that very much needs protection. Um, if there's any neighborhood in Durham other than Old West Durham and Golden Belt that need this kind of protection, it is Cleveland Holloway. Please support this and support Alternative A. Thank you. Uh, good evening, board members. members. My name is Chris Graves. My wife and I live at uh, 523 Holloway Street. Uh, we have two young daughters, and we would like to uh, support Alternative A, uh, mainly because this neighborhood 
oh, seven, eight years ago, nobody wanted to live there. Now, a lot of people want to live there. We want to uh, support this alternative A because it will um, um, continue to uh, continue to um, support the uh, integrity and character of the neighborhood that's still developing. Um, it, otherwise, the, the integrity of the neighborhood could be compromised. Thank you. Hello, my name is Keely McPhee. I live at 204 North Dillard Street, and I'd like you to support Alternative A for the Historic District. Thank you. My name is Natalie Spring, and 12 years ago next Tuesday, I bought a little house at 503 North Queen Street. I currently reside at 406 Oakwood Avenue and have a couple of other properties in the neighborhood that would be impacted by this. Um, I'm here to support the local historic district alternative A. Um, one of the reasons that is incredibly important to me is because of the underlying, underlying zoning that goes with these parcels in the 600 block. Um, my house on Queen Street used to be in DDO 3. Um, when the DDO structures were replaced by the Support 1 and Support 2 districts, neighbors in the 500 block of Queen Street successfully advocated to have our properties taken out of Support 2 for the fact that we didn't want people to consolidate property ownership, tear down the houses, and build a massive structure. The 600 block of Queen Street is still in Support 2. I have a picture that I'll pass around that demonstrates what that means. Um, on a very basic level, they get 50 feet to build up. A single story, two story houses would be directly across the street from 50 feet, which in and of itself is difficult to comprehend. Um, the additional layer to that is the parcels slope down 20 feet from Roxborough to Queen Street. So because of the way the lots averaged in measurement, it would actually mean that the building on the 600 block of Queen Street, where there is site plan and there's not a site plan, could be up to 70 feet on Queen Street. So we could potentially be authorizing 70 feet of building across from single story houses. And I've taken pictures of the 600 block of different views so you can see what it looks like on the ground. I took these pictures this morning so that you could see today what it looks like. Right now, it's a vacant, overgrown, weedy lot. That's it. Neighbors don't want it to stay a vacant, overgrown, weedy lot. We want development there. We want a big, dense structure on Roxborough that tapers into the neighborhood. That's what our hope is, that whatever is built on that parcel eventually, and it will be built on because it's right, we're right downtown, will taper into the neighborhood and provide a transition from density in downtown in Roxborough to the very human scale single story houses that are on Queen Street. Um, I just, oh, oh well, I, they're passing around, whatever's easier. I'll give time up and then if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them because I've, know all of these merry bandits here. Hi, I'm Suzanne Julian. I live at 614 North Queen Street. So um, the vacant lot with all the kudzu is right in front of my house. And the kudzu is kind of pretty in its way, but I'm very eager to see the lot be developed. Um, I'm just a renter, but I really love my neighborhood. And I'm also eager to make sure that however it's developed, it matches the character of the neighborhood. and isn't a really out of place, huge hulking building. So I urge you to vote for alternative A. Thank you. Hi, I'm Holly Dwan. I live at 527 Holloway Street. And I just wanna note that we have met as a neighborhood multiple times um, to discuss this development and consistently have said we are, are totally for development. Um, the concern for me is primarily what Natalie Spring discussed in terms of the potential for the building being 70 feet tall. At this point, there's no restriction against it. Um, and this is butting up to a street that does not have lines. Um, it, there's not two lanes to it. There's no sidewalk. Um, I just, I, I don't understand how that would demonstrate uh, strategic planning. So. If we are able to have this part of the local historic district, then like it's already been stated, it would integrate into our neighborhood in a place where it would really, really need to be integrated. Thank you. I'm Maureen Kurtz and I moved to Cleveland Holloway four years ago and I'm also in favor of Alternative A. Um, basically because we do need protection on 
Queen Street there. Um, the houses out there are small. The street is narrow. There are no sidewalks. It's heavily used. And with that lot being completely in um, to the S2 zoning, it allows too large and dense of a structure on Queen Street. So we would like to see a big development on Roxborough and something um, like row houses or duplexes or single family homes, whatever it might be um, along Queen Street would be great. Or just something that does not dwarf the rest of Queen Street. And also we definitely have some concerns about how traffic would be routed if an extremely large block structure went into that parcel. So we're hoping that having the local historic district would allow us future input on to how uh, something is built there. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dewey Williams. I do not live in the neighborhood, but my uh, daughter does, and she has prepared a very brief uh, statement that she wanted me to play this recording for a uh, for the council. Okay, sir. Before you play that, I want to make sure that the audio technician in the back can pick that up fairly well. Okay. So she hadn't came out yet, so I'm assuming she can. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hello, I'm Tiffany Graves, and I live on the 500 block of Holloway Street. I want to voice my opinion on the Cleveland Holloway Local Historic District. I'm asking for you to ensure the stable, steady, and most importantly, planned future growth of Cleveland Holloway by selecting option A and including the 600 block of Clean Street. I'm sure I stand with my neighbors here in saying we want growth and development, even dense development on that block. I want to be clear that selecting option A will not stop development. It will, however, make sure that any future development is appropriately planned. A couple of years ago, there would not be an option A or B. The block would be included by default. That's because as recently as then, there were historic houses there. Going back further, the block was full of historic homes. Decades of deterioration, destruction, and systematic removal of homes under the same ownership has made the block vacant. The reality is that the developers are not saving a vacant lot. They created a vacant lot to develop from what's contributing neighborhood homes. I want it understood that selecting the wrong option here will send a message that it's all right to erode away Durham neighborhoods, even historic neighborhoods, a piece at a time, for the sake of building a development without having to consider the neighborhood at all. I'm not stating that these particular developers would be completely inconsiderate to the neighborhood, but they have the right to sell that land tomorrow to anyone. Please give a layer of added protection and appropriateness to a rightfully historic block. From a planning perspective, a neighborhood perspective, and even a common sense map perspective, option A is the correct choice. The HPC has recommended you select option A. The neighbors here that live across the street or near that block, who walk right and drive those streets, who care about the land separate from its monetary potential, have recommended you select option A. Please make sure that 100 years from now, like 100 years ago, Cleveland Holloway is a wonderful neighborhood. Thank you for your time and thoughtful decision. She would like for all those 4A to stand. Thank you. Thank you. We have two people signed up against of those individuals here. Three? Okay. If you can make your way over and still have, we'll give you, uh, I guess, about 12 minutes if we can suspend the rules since the last comment ran over. We can suspend the rules and give the uh, opposition 12 minutes. Is that okay? Unanimous consent? Okay, good enough. Okay. Um, my name is Emily Eggie, and I'm the executive director of SEEDS, uh, which is adjacent to the Cleveland Holloway neighborhood. And I suppose that I have a, um, uh, a qualified um, uh, approval here or request here. Um, we would like to request that um, the map not include 408 Elizabeth, 704, and 706 Gilbert Street, which is the properties that SEEDS owns and that are our uh, educational community gardens. And I bring this to the attention of the commission now 
because the original map that we saw, I believe about two years ago, uh, did not include our properties and frankly, um, I didn't pay attention to the next map because I thought that it didn't uh, pertain to seeds. Um, we're not uh, opposed to um, a historic district in the area. We simply wish for the seeds property to not be um, included within, um, within that border. Um, my concern comes from the uh, financial and the potential financial and aesthetic impact of being required to follow local historic guidelines on um, future development at our nonprofit um, gardens. And uh, with fences, sheds, other potential structures that are important in the development and in the constant redevelopment and keeping a, um, a very open and inviting space, um, uh, the examples that we have seen of fencing and other things that comply with the local historic district um, regulations uh, and standards um, really do not fit with the um, with kind of the DIY, DIY aesthetic and um, the community feel that we'd like to continue to grow into. Um, and uh, that is that is my specific request. So thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Tyler Waring. I live at 507 Mallard Avenue. Um, I have to, uh, I'm here today to oppose the district, um, specifically because um, I wasn't really included in uh, the discussion to be a part of the district until probably about, you know, we'll say 16 hours before the application was submitted. Um, uh, once I was asked to sign the application, I um, opted not to and requested that my property be removed since it was along the um, edge boundary of this. Um, so for that reason, um, I'm going to have to um, oppose this. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Thanks for your patience. Uh, my name is Mark Galifianakis, and uh, together with my father, Nick Galifianakis, and James Bradford, uh, we own the uh, block in question that has caused the uh, alternative A and alternative B options that you see in the staff report. Uh, this is the block bounded by Roxboro, Mallard Avenue, Queen Street, and, um, and Elliott Street. <clears throat> I'd like to give you a little background real quick just so you know who we are and the history of this property. Uh, it is a whole city block. It's two acres. Uh, my uh, uh, partner in ownership on this property, James Bradford, couldn't be here tonight because he's out of state uh, handling a family commitment uh, that's health related. He has owned most of this block for over 25 years. Uh, my father, Nick, has owned about a third of the block for almost 50 years. Uh, that property prior was owned by my grandfather, Manuel Galifianakis. Uh, he immigrated this country and made his way to Durham, got here about 1928 or 30 and never left. He raised his family on what's now called Mallard Avenue, it, back then it was Markham Street. He raised four boys. <clears throat> they all went to Durham Public Schools. Uh, they all walked to uh, Fuller School, which is now where DPS has offices a block away from the site. Uh, they all graduated from Durham High. They went to Duke University, UNC, NC State. Uh, my father went to law school at Duke and also taught at Duke. Uh, so to the point that we could sell the property any day, it, we've had that option over the decades and never taken it. And so as far as the historic significance of a property <clears throat> that has no contributing structures on it, it couldn't mean more to anyone else in this room probably than me, uh, just because uh, that's where my family came from. We, um, James and I spent a good year and a half uh, at the request of a couple of city council members preserving the two houses that used to be on the site. Uh, it, we did not profit from that exercise. It took a lot of time, effort, and energy. And we made sure that the houses were relocated in the neighborhood. They are now in the neighborhood on Gurley Street. They're 
perfectly restored, they're owner occupied, they're contributing structures now where before they were not. Um, in addition to that, during that year and a half, we worked with Preservation Durham, we worked with Preservation North Carolina, and we worked with the State Historic Preservation Office. Uh, all three of those organi organizations who are not here tonight to speak against us. <laughs> um, that, that we worked with those folks hand in hand to preserve those houses. As far as the potential development of this site, their main concern, their major concern was, please preserve those houses. And if you can, keep them close. There were people interested in taking them to Hillsborough and, and to Old North Durham. We did the research to find the lots to relocate them, and, and that's been done. So we have been practicing historic preservation. In addition to that, just on personal note, I live in a National Register Historic District. I live in a local historic district. I live in a 131-year-old house that I restored. I've been through the COA process many, many times uh, from my own personal residence. So uh, personally, I'm a fan of historic preservation, and we have practiced that in Cleveland Holloway recently. So we just want to give you that perspective of who we are. We're not uh, some out-of-state developers coming in, so I can't see another ownership group that would be better to have working on a potential project on this site. Um, so that's, that's the background uh, on us. And we, we started to design this project after the city initiated rezoning of downtown Durham, and that happened in 2010. So since 2010, we've engaged land planners, and we've engaged architects, and we've done market studies, and we have created, we've, we've been through two renditions, we've created a, a potential project that fits within the zoning that we were given. We did not seek that zoning. That was the zoning, the S2 zoning that's on the site. We responded to it, and in the last three years, that's what we've been working on. So to rezone this property now would be like pulling the rug out from under us. Um, so we're just here tonight basically playing defense. Um, and trying to keep our site under one zoning so it can be a unified development, a quality development that will be cohesive and designed and work well together and work well within the neighborhood. And I, I do appreciate the neighbor's concerns, but you also have to understand we are on the edge of the neighborhood. We are on a two-lane, one-way street that is a major north running corridor, and that's Roxborough. There is a lot of traffic on that road. So building six or seven bungalows along Roxborough Street is not, not really an option, and the site's not big enough to transition down. I do want to correct um, Natalie's point, and if, if you'll direct a question to staff, they can straighten it out for you. There's no way we can go to 70 feet on Queen Street. It's, it's a matter of averaging. So we can't start out at 50 feet on Roxborough and then go straight across and end up 70 feet on, um, on Queen Street. That's just... Um, that's just not accurate, so I will hope you'll um, ask staff to address that. I'll, I'll reserve a little bit of time. I'm going to let Chris speak, and if you have any questions for me, I'll be glad to come back and answer them. Thank you. Three minutes. Good evening. My name is Chris Dickey, and I live at 311 Oakwood Avenue, and I'm here representing my family. Uh, my wife couldn't be here today. She had to take my son to basketball practice. Uh, Christopher's at the age of 13. I have a 21-year-old daughter, 24-year-old son, and a 25-year-old daughter. The reason why I'm coming to you today is because 311 Oakwood is an investment for me. I moved in that particular area when it was in fashionable back in 1993. In addition to that, I have another piece of property that uh, on 401 Oakwood that I've agreed to put into the, the, the historic district. The reason why I'm adamant about my property not being included in this particular district is that on the DD2, it allows me an economic benefit that either I can take advantage of or my family can take advantage of in reference to providing housing on that land. I have one of the largest lots in that particular area there. And the lot size is 120 by 143 by 126 by 150. What's by me, behind me is Oakwood Park which is on the south side. On the west side is Genesis Home, which is about a 45-foot structure. Across the street from me is a vacant parcel. And on the north side is a, is a house that I own. So I'm bombarded by what I own in that particular, that particular area there. 
I believe in reference to what, in the future development, what downtown is moving and going towards in reference to providing affordable housing is consistent with the downtown updated master, plas master plan of 2007. Here it is right here on page 36. It talks about increased residential development here, which supports this project here. In addition to that, in reference to the Unified Development Ordinance in 2010, this went before City Council in reference to bringing this property, this, well, my particular property as well as the gentleman's property here, where, there was, uh, where the community was adamant about net not being incorporated, City Council made the decision to incorporate our properties because they felt like it was taking away an economic benefit and what came up was the height standards at that particular time and moment. So what I'm saying to you all is that I understand it's a very difficult situation. My home is located on the outskirts. I felt like me as a homeowner, uh, I bought a home across the street as well. I brought that up to, to standards. Uh, when my kids get out of college, I'll be able to work on my home, maintain the integrity of that there. But I also want the opportunity to build something. Th trying to build something three stories is very difficult and affordable. You need the mass to go upward to provide something affordable. And I feel like that's what I want to take advantage of and pass, if I can't do it, but pass those land rights and air rights onto my kids as an economic benefit. Thank you. Thank you. We'll close the uh, public hearing and bring it back before the commissioners. Do you have anyone signed up to speak? Commissioner Whitley. I need to ask staff, did, did um, planning provide um, staff support for um, developing this historical district? Sarah Young with the planning department. This plan was developed by the planning staff. Planning staff went out and field surveyed um, all the properties in the district and surrounding areas, as well as doing all of the revisions to the preservation plan itself. At, it, at um, any point, um, did, um, did you consider um, meeting the needs of those people that, that wanted to opt out? We did. We had uh, both community meetings and we heard one-on-one -on -one from uh, the folks that have, uh, or the majority of the folks that requested to be removed from the boundary. Um, we have detailed in the staff report our rationale for why we support including those properties as well as having including some, some of the photographs of those contributing historic properties as justification for why they should be included in the historic district. I would like to note that uh, inclusion in the district would not prevent any future development. It would just mean that any new development would have to go through the certificate of appropriateness process, and there is criteria in the preservation plan for new construction. I think, um, thank you. I think it's kind of interesting that um, the people that um, that want to opt out have been there longer than the people that want to take away their rights. And although they have the majority, um, majority should not be able to um, take advantage of the minority. Um, I, I remember that neighborhood when it was bad. And I'm like, I'm quite proud of what's been done there. You know, I, I um, in fact, when people come to town, I take them through Cleveland Holloway. But it seemed like to me there ought to be a way to work this out, especially since the people that have been there the longest, that want to be opted out, live right on the edge. And to take away their economic, um, um, investment um, seems to me to be a tragedy. Um, a good idea that needs to be um, that needs to be worked out. Um, is it possible to um, extend this for 30 days so that um, so that it can work this out? 
Is that a possibility? Good evening, Steve Medlin with the Durham City County Planning Department. This is a zoning request, so as you are aware, the Planning Commission by statute actually has the ability to continue an item for up to 90 days from the initial public hearing if that's your, your, your decision to do so. I, I mean, C is one of those other, other projects that I take pride, pride in. You know, um, they have nothing to do with the architecture, or, uh, historical history, and the idea to take them on and to to um, to impose your will on them seems to me something that needs to be be worked out. I'm hoping that um, you will find the willingness to hear them and work something out come to a mutual agreement. I want to support this, but I cannot support it when it um, when there's a steamroller uh, um, in, in effect. Commissioner Padgett. You know, when this first started, when we first started this, my thoughts were pretty clear that, wow, this is an overwhelming response here that this is going to be pretty quick and no-brainer. Um, as time went and I started uh, listening to the other uh, speakers who oppose this, and I listened to the family history, and I, and I listened to the hopes for the future, I, I realized then that it's not really a slam dunk like I thought it was going to be. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm with Mr. Whitley here. I, you know, I, I think that there has to be some community involvement and not the steamroller effect. So, you know, for me to vote tonight, I'm going to vote in opposition to this. But, you know, I really think that we need to look at this. This is, you know, it almost sounds like big government taking over and we'll, we'll, we'll spread the bodies thin where they lay. So, you know, I'm, you know, if we vote tonight, I can tell you I'm going to oppose. Mr. Lale. Yes, sir. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, I'm new to this rodeo, so bear with me. Um, I had a point of clarification that I, for staff, I believe that I think I now understand, but just for my own sake, is the commission being asked to approve the, the district um, or not? And in the case of yes, weigh in on option A and option B. Is that essentially the question before us? I apologize again for my lack of clarity. Uh, Steve Medlin with the Durham Planning Department once again. Uh, yes, in essence, you're, you are correct. We are asking for the commission to modify the uh, preservation plan associated with Cle Cleveland Holloway and as well to make a recommendation as it relates to the application of the actual boundaries of the district uh, based on the application that we've received from the neighborhood. Certainly before the board this evening are the alternatives that we put out before you, um, but that you're not limited to only those alternatives. You can actually, if you so choose, make a recommendation to retract the boundaries even more to remove uh, those properties in addition to just those that are in option B, if that's your, if that's your, your, your will. Keep in mind, you are making a recommendation on this. You are not approving this. Uh, ultimately, your recommendation will be provided to the city council for their consideration. So, thank you, <laughs> Commissioner Beachwood. What I what I see is a, is something that I think we're going to be seeing a lot of, and that is when when the downtown design districts and the and the sub districts one and two put up against the downtown neighborhoods. We're going to be seeing we're going to be seeing um, difficulties. This is this is difficult to overlay a design district and a downtown district right up next to residential downtown communities, especially historic ones. So there's bound this is bound to be difficult. That being said, um, I, I also cannot see that there's just a one one way answer. It's not going to be an A or an B, and I think we are going to have to do some some um, some triage here regarding the, the uh, regarding the options, and I personally would rather see um, the 
um, contiguous properties on Queen Street remain in the district, and I would like to see those individuals, including Seeds, and the individuals who came up tonight. And I, I don't know whether they're on the map, uh, designated on the map or not. I suspect some of them are and some of them are not. This is the map that has the orange. Um, but, but I would like to see those folks um, that requested to be out uh, omitted from the district for the reasons that I have stated. And that seems to me as, as it's not going to be as tidy a district, and it, it's um, obviously got a downside. I wouldn't, I would imagine that the planning department's already looked at some of those options and decided that they were not the most optimal options for their desire to create a comprehensive, tidy um, package of a, um, a district that made sense. But I, either that, or they just have to go back to the to the to the table and, and start working through this again. I mean, that would be the easy the easy the easy answer for us to do up here would be for us to to um, hammer out a an option C. But I'm not even sure we should be doing that. I mean, it seems seems to me we should do it. that the community should meet back with the planning department and get and get this done. So I guess. I guess what I would actually rather see is a, is a, a several month maybe um, continuation. You, you, uh, if, you, if I can, you yes. do not have that as an option. <laughs> That's not an option before you this evening. Did you, did you not say that we had a continuation? Not for seven months. No, not seven months. Seven. Well, okay. I, just, I, I apologize. I thought you said seven. <laughs> you said several, <laughs> and I'm thinking 60 days. I'm getting days. old, and my hearing's not as good as it used to be. So, um, does it, does it sound reasonable that, that the uh, planning department could go back to the table again for 60 days, or is that enough time, not enough time? If I might, Pat Young with the planning department. Uh, e each of the folks that spoke in opposition to what's before you tonight, um, there was a fairly detailed analysis provided by staff in your staff report about why staff believes those should be included in the district. Um, it's my professional opinion that a delay will not result in any different result or any different um, recommendation by staff, but we certainly serve at your pleasure in terms of up to the 90-day deferral, and, and Sarah can elaborate on that. I would like to make one clarification on what Mr. Young said. The um, one group that I did not hear from until yesterday was SEEDS, so that is why their um, request to not be in is not detailed in the issues section of your um, staff report. I will say that um, one thing that sets aside the other um, areas from the North Queen Street area is that North Queen Street is now completely vacant. The other uh, properties, uh, 507 Mallard and 311 Oakwood, do have what we consider contributing historic structures, um, particularly the 311 Oakwood structure is a very impressive structure. Um, and in terms of keeping with preservation policies, uh, it does seem to staff that that would be an important structure architecturally to try and uh, save uh, under our historic preservation program. So that is why uh, staff put forward the recommendation they did. Miss, we have uh, Miss Board, Mr. Gibbs, then Dr. Winders. Yeah, um, I have to go to several others. I thought this was going to be easy. I was going to vote for A, and community wanted A and seemed easy. And now I think that what I want, I'm not sure if it's possible. What I would really like to see here is some kind of a transitional area because especially in the area like Queen Street, I think that to have anything goes on one side of the street and historical houses on the other side of the street just does not make any sense. I, I believe that coming in and I still believe that. But on the other hand, I would not be opposed to granting the owners of those properties that are empty and on the fringe of the, of the district to have a little bit more flexibility. Um, and I'm, it would be nice to see something that really carefully outlines what they could do and what they can't do. I don't know if there's any way to document those transitional areas, though. Uh, in the current Unified Development Ordinance, the section that talks about historic um, districts and also in the general statutes, there is no, the local historic district overlay is kind of a, there is no transitional yeah. area. Black and white. It either is or it isn't. Mr. 
Mr. Gibbs. Well, your last statement just sort of uh, shut my idea down. Uh, I think, and we have seen this in some other areas, and we'll probably, probably will be seeing it more and more. I think there should be some, some way to establish a transitional, uh, a transition from one area to this, his, for instance, this historic area, uh, rather than have, and I've seen some plans of this proposed development and it goes right up to the property line, seven stories, I believe is what it is. That's a bit much, uh, especially when there are, I'll say, bungalows across the street. But I would like one, I'd like for you to answer some. I, I missed this while I go. Along the Queen Street uh, area toward the Holloway Street end, I, I rode by there, but now I can't remember. There are some houses there now, aren't there? Where, where this is supposed to be extending the, the boundary for the historic district. Yes, the, uh, the blocks just north and south of the red, in the map that you're looking on right now, both have structures on them. It is just the, the block highlighted in red, those five lots that basically face North Queen, those are vacant. In fact, that, that entire city block is vacant. Okay, so if they were to be building on at this development, proposed development, uh, if they were to be building, they would not be building up to Queen Street, would they? So the provisions of the downtown design ditch district uh, do have a 12-foot build-to line from the back of curb. So right. a building, unless it was, um, the only exception is the monumental building type, which is not a building type that they would be using. So they would be required to build 12 feet from the back of curb, yes, including on North Queen Street. Uh, one thing that I will note is that effectively applying the historic district overlay would kind of create a transitional effect because the, in going to the Historic Preservation Commission for approval, the commission would look at issues of compatibility that the regular zoning um, can't neatly address. And so they may, through that process, um, ask the developer to do certain things with the building to make it fit in and transition better to, uh, into the neighborhood. So there would uh, a step back there uh, to soften the edge just on Queen Street side. Right. That would not, and this is something that the developer, I guess, would have to proffer, I guess. Uh, that would be something that the Historic Preservation Commission could ask for if they felt that, uh, that that would help uh, make the project more compatible with the historic neighborhood. Okay, thanks. Dr. Winders. I think uh, I really wanted to ask the same question. It's, it's very unfortunate. It seems like the, uh, uh, the support to district, you know, that build to line is just a, a really wrong thing to have right next to the, to the historic uh, district. And it's like we've made, the policy has made the um, developer um, design it that way. But of uh, which is unfortunate, but it's not the first time somebody's gotten caught in a rezoning and had to and had to have his plans uh, revised. <laughs> but it is unfortunate. So we have um, Commissioner Muskie. Then we'll go back to Commissioner Whitley, and we'll take a motion. Okay. A question for staff. So uh, the 311 Oakwood, which would be this one, this corner jutting out at the very bottom. Okay. And so that was, that was put in there at your discretion. And yeah. as well as the one across the street, the 401, right? Those were, those were actually at the time of the rezoning to the design district and the previous, I believe, um, old DDO zoning, 
uh, they were asked for by the uh, property owners to be included. Uh, the property owners that own it now? Or? Yes. Okay, they asked. At least the 311 Oakwood. Mr. Dickey was supportive, I believe, of including that in the downtown design district when it was created. Um, Is that correct, Chris? It, could you repeat that on the microphone sir I'm sorry about that I did agree to be a part of the design district the okay. DD2 district my home to be in there but not a part of the historic well uh, not not a part of this okay. plan here the 401 Oakwood property I did agree to for the historic for, 401 Oakwood I did agree to for the historic overlay. for the historic overlay okay 401 okay. I did Great, okay. So, um, okay, thanks for that clarification. I was a little confused. It just, uh, I'm, I'm having a hard time uh, saying that we should go ahead and extend this, extend these boundaries, extend this zoning without some kind of concurrence from the property owners because it seems that we're, we are limiting their, their property rights by doing this. And so, um, I, I think I agree with Reverend Whitley that we ought to uh, consider going back and getting the concurrence from those people that, that we need concurrence from to, to include in this plan. Thank you. Reverend Whitley. Um, I understand um, the city's desire, but the city has put forth a proposal that puts neighbors against neighbors. And these are people that you live with. And I, I just have, you know, I love the city. And I know that neighborhood surrounds this city. I've been a big proponent, proponent of claiming our history. So we're gonna have this problem, like was said earlier, um, in the next time we try to do this. So let's try to work this out this time. And you know, I, I'm not, I don't believe in something is impossible. You know, so I would ask that um, um, the city um, give itself 60 days to work this out and bring it back. You know, I want to vote for this. Um, but uh, neighbors against neighbors? No, I think we can do better than that. Mr. Davis. I hate to belabor the point, it's getting late, but staff, um, it was kind of interpreted by me, which I feel the same way, if you guys extend this. We already have the opposition here. They don't want to be a part of it. I don't know if the 60 day uh, delay will make it any better um, based upon the effort that you've already put in. Um, so I kind of would say to the commissioners, let's just vote either to make the recommendation for or against today so that, you know, it will move forward to the next step. We already know our concerns. We can express them in our comments. Um, but I don't think um, delaying this will uh, make this any better. Anyone else? Okay, so what's before us is going to be option, well, alternative A or B. So to recap, alternative A is the inclusion of the properties. Say it again. Yes, sir. Uh, excuse me once again, Steve Mantlin with the Planning Department. Uh, while what's before you in the staff report is option A or B, again, you as a body do have the ability to make a recommendation beyond that if you feel like the boundaries need to be modified additionally. You can't ex uh, extend them, but you can retract them, if that is your, is your will. Okay. So, and I'm assuming that can be done within the 60-day deferral to go back? No, you, you just so just, to oh, to now. You, you, you just need to do that as part of your motion, if oh, that is your yes. intent. Okay. So, can we get a motion? Yes. You can. I have a motion to... Um, approve the boundaries with the exception of item um, area one, two, uh, three, four, 
Well, four and five, I don't know about. See, it's hard to know because I don't know what people are connected with which ones of these, but I know where Seeds is, and they don't, they, they're clearly not wanting to be in. This page. Include, including section, uh, this is now on page three, three of that part of your packet. It's the map with the colored and numbered areas. Yeah. So area, area six would be the? Area six is North Queen Street. North Queen Street, that stays in. That's my motion. And to not include section one. Well, if I, I'm sorry to interrupt, my apologies. The section one has never been in question. No one has spoken here. Okay. At, well, uh, is that, hold on, hold on, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me check on what the, is the Mallard property. There is one property, not all of section one, let me see. And actually the property in question on Mallard is not even in section one. That is a separate property, 507 Mallard. Well, seeds is section two. Who's section three? Uh, section three has, uh, was not, uh, no one has asked to be removed from section three. Where are the, where are the properties? Yes, sir. If, if you can, excuse me, yeah. if you can turn in your staff report <clears throat> yep. to parcel page, numbers. To uh, page number six. Okay, that one, yeah. With the exception of the seeds property, which is, I ask yeah. you to keep flipping backwards and forwards here, but basically the okay, seeds yeah, yeah, property yeah. is area two on the prior map. The, the other property owners that have spoken here this evening that wish to be removed are identified on this map. Oh, thank you. Seeds. Thank you. Then my... Um, my move, um, I would move to approve, approve the boundary with, uh, and, and including the um, Queen Street properties and not including the other two properties that are in orange on page six. Also the Seeds property, which is um, on the west side. So that would be, yeah. Mr. Chair? Yes, ma'am. I'd like to make a substitute motion for a 60-day deferral. Okay. So we're substitute. having this much trouble making the motion. I and think we need more first. clarification. Think the original okay. motion will need a second. Yeah, we need to right. So he's got a second. Oh, no. Is it Smutsky or Paget? Whitley. Whitley second the the original motion. Okay. And that was to keep area Mike, please. six in. Correct. The other two property owners requesting yeah, removal seeds. plus seeds. Oh. Yes. So do we need to restate that so everyone is clear or or is everyone clear on what's being voted on now? Okay, so now we have a substitute motion. So the substitute motion, yeah, so if there's no second on the substitute motion, the substitute motion fails and we go back to the first original motion. Is that right, Paula? You didn't give it an opportunity for a second. Okay, gotcha. So, here we go. I make a, mo a substitute motion for a 60-day deferral to clarify these um, iffy properties. We have no second, so the substitute motion fails. We back to the first original motion. Could you restate the original motion, ma'am? I move to approve the boundaries with the inclusion of um, six, area six, which is the Queen Street properties, and not include the property owners requesting removal, which are on our map, and also the seeds properties. Section two, page three. Can we get a second? The, the, that was okay. already seconded. So we have some moving property second. All those in favor, let it be known by raising your right hand. All right. Thank you. Any hold up, sir. Hold up a second. Any, any opposition? No. Got, okay. Got. I'm in. Yeah. I'm. I'm in. I, apparently, I got confused on this vote because of the way it was running here. Now because I want to include the properties 
of the, of the gentleman that we're speaking, I mean, to exclude, exclude the properties from the gentleman speaking up here. Did that motion exclude that property? Yes. No. What? See, that we're all confused on how that's running. So. Wait a minute, I thought that was important. You were, you know, you went the other way. So that, that was a mixed communication on the vote. We need to clarify what we're voting on officially. We're, we are going to try to put a map up um, for you to look at very quickly that will define the areas as the motion was made right. by Commissioner uh, Beachwood. And Mr. Chair, it may be cleaner to have someone to make a motion to reconsider the motion. Okay. So, can we get a motion to reconsider? So the moved. Okay. Thank you. Move second. Yeah. Second. All right, all those in favor? Right hand. Okay, so clean, everybody's, okay. So we, we, we have hit the reset button. Let's try it again. All right. Okay, would it be helpful if I pointed out on the map the specific properties? Yes. Okay, let's hope, hoping that the pointer works. Uh, the, the one that had the yeah, I don't have that one on oh, here, sorry, that. my apologies. Um, oh. Pointer doesn't work over that, does it? No, it does not work over that. This ought to be fine. Okay, so this parcel right here is the 507 Mallard parcel. These parcels along North Elliott. Ah, thank you. This is the 311 Oakwood parcel. Let's see if I can just do that. And then number two are the seeds parcels. One question. Do these parcels, are they going to and then this be excluded that we're pointing out that includes the property that are already listed in, in this next motion? That's what I want to make sure. Yes, please do. <laughs> yes, sir, you have a question? I try to keep it simple. Okay. Uh, I, would, I, would move, I would make a motion that would exclude the red zones plus section two, which is the seized property. Right. That would be my motion. Right. No, that's not what they want. That's not what they want. I'm going to make a motion to accept the boundaries with the exception of the Mallard property, which is the red one at the top, the Oakwood property, which is the red one at the bottom, and the Seeds property, which is number two. Does, does that cover? It does not cover Queen Street. So, does that cover the other Commissioners, problems? so when you, you voted to reconsider the original motion, which was Commissioner Beachwood's motion, which included the two red properties plus on the one on Queen Street, the one on Mallard Street, and the Seeds properties, but not the ones on. You said that wrong. Queen. I did say, I said that wrong. Let me, let me try and see if we, um, the motion is to include within the boundaries of the historic district, the property, the, the properties on Queen Street but to exclude from the boundaries the properties on Mallard 
oak wood and the seeds property. Now, is that what you? Yes. Yes. And, and Commissioner Smudsky can make, or anyone else can make a substitute motion to that if to include or exclude additional property. Okay. Hope. Before we, before we go down the road of repetitive substitute motions, so it's documented here what everyone wants so far. Yes. All right. So now, the two gentlemen in the back, are your property in or out? Are you satisfied with what's being offered now? You got to come up here. Okay, yeah. hold on. Come, come back around. I can't hear you, but we want to make sure, since we have this option that we rarely ever have, if we can clean this up now, then it would be all good for everybody. This is my property here. Based upon the motion, I, I want to. We can't oh, see. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Use the pointer. Right there. Okay. Okay, that's my so property. So are you satisfied with what's being said? So, so I'm out. You're out. That's what I want out. You want out. Right. Is it documented here you want out? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, Mark Galifianakis again. As I understood um, Commissioner Beachwood's proposal, it was to take all the parcels out of uh, that were requested to be omitted ex except for except for ours along Queen Street. That that's how I understood. Okay. The motion. So and, are you and so we want to be out. So you're, you're, you're happy with? No, absolutely. No, no. no. So you no. skipped okay. over his property. So no. That's what it, I was it, it covers every property requested to be out except, so except for ours, which so has get, no contributing structure. So you get tagged and nobody else does. Correct. Yes, yes sir. All right. We've had oh, discussion, I'm sure. Hold on. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to help clarify things maybe a little bit. On page seven, commissioners? There are a picture of the two properties on Oakwood and Mallard mm -hmm. that we are, the current motion would exclude. So we are, the current motion would exclude, would include the empty properties, but exclude these two very clear historical homes. I so to me that. I don't know. So what is this property? Oh, it's 607, 607. Queen. Everybody's good. Yes. All right, so based on this recommendation that moves from here to city council, everyone for the most part is okay with what's being proposed as of now. Is, is okay, so no, with, the no, with, no. The with the exception of no. Mr. No. Galvin, Galifianakis, Mark, Mark, sorry, Mark. Okay, so with this recommendation, it now Depends on what happened here. It still goes to city council, and from there you can propose something else. But I think we got most everybody somewhat happy. We can move this issue on to the next leg. Okay. So, Ms. Beachwood, if you can restate your motion, and I think we've answered all the questions from the commissioners. We'll move it on, and Mr. Mark, we'll let you do your lobbying effort with city council. I make a motion to. Approve the boundaries with the following changes. We will include um, parcel six along Queens, which is part of the boundary, which is now within the boundary, but we are going to exclude the property on Mallard and the property in red that's on Oakwood and also the seeds property to the west of the boundary. Can we get a second? Excuse me. Yes, sir. Um, just a point of clarification on yes. the motion. Uh, Commissioner Beachwood, did you mean to include the modifications to the preservation plan in addition to the boundaries of the district? Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm not trying to confuse you. Yes. I just wanted, <laughs> wanted it for the record. Yes. Thank you. Uh, another point of information. Uh, would not the seeds property be on the east, not the west? As, as is listed on the map. Yes. Yes. Okay, so can we get a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and properly second. All those in favor, let it be known by raising your right hand. In or out? Okay. Any opposition? Four, five, four, five, six. It's a motion fails. Motion fails six to six. Okay. Got a question. All right, so thank you. So Mr. Uh, Davis has to be excused for the remainder of the meeting. So from here, it goes to uh, city council. 
So motion is denied because it tied. So it goes to city council and we wish that the community move this to the next leg and go to city council and present your case again. Maybe get more leeway from that governing body. All right, thank you for coming out. Okay, we're almost there. Okay, so we're going to be on new business A, which is the say it again, which is the resolution to honor uh, Commissioners Martin and Allen, they couldn't be here tonight, so I'll read this into the public record if that's okay, and we'll make sure that the planning department get these uh, certificates to, or these resolutions to these individuals. And we'll start with uh, Mr. Martin, and it reads, Resolution and Appreciation of Mr. I. Jarvis Martin. Whereas Mr. I. Jarvis Martin was a member of the Durham Planning Commission from March 2005 through June 2013, and whereas the, plan the Durham Planning Commission and the citizens of the city and county of Durham have benefited from the dedicated efforts that he displayed while serving as a member of the Durham Planning Commission and whereas the commission desires to express its appreciation for the public of a job well done, now therefore let it be resolved by the Durham Planning Commission, section one, that this commission does hereby express its sincere appreciation for the service rendered by Mr. Martin to the citizens of this community. community. Section two, that the, that the clerk of this commission is hereby directed to spread this resolution in its entirety upon the minutes of this commission and this resolution is hereby presented to Mr. Martin as a token of the high esteem held for him adopted this ninth day of July 2013 Antonio Jones chairman the second one is a resolution in appreciation for Mrs. Tanya Mitchell Allen Whereas Mrs. Ms. Tanya Mitchell Allen was a member of the Durham Planning Commission from July 2007 through June 2013, and whereas the Durham Planning Commission and the citizens of the city and the county of Durham have benefited from the dedicated efforts that she displayed while serving as a member of the Durham Planning Commission, and whereas the commission desires to express its appreciation for the public of a job well done, now therefore be it resolved by the Durham Planning Commission, Section 1, that this commission is hereby express its sincere appreciation for the service rendered by Ms. Mitchell Allen to the citizens of this community. Section two, that the clerk of this commission is hereby directed to spread its, this resolution in, in its entirety upon the official minutes of this commission and this resolution is hereby presented to Ms. Mitchell Allen as a token of the high esteem held for her adopted this ninth day of July 2013, Antonio Jones, chairman. So we'll have planning department make sure that those two individuals get that. And we'll move down to 7B, the briefing downtown open space plan. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Again, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Uh, as you'll recall at our retreat several months ago, uh, one of the key topics we focused on was trying to ensure that you all had uh, more, more and better information earlier in the process on our long-range comprehensive planning projects. And what you're going to hear tonight from uh, Tom Dawson, who's the case manager for our downtown open space plan, is the first of that series, where he will give you a very brief overview of the downtown open space plan, where we're at in it, the main goals, um, and take any questions you have. And I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Dawson. Hi. I'm Tom Dawson of the Planning Department. Um, I'm, I'll be giving a, a brief update on the downtown open space planning process. Um, so to give you an idea, I'm going to give you a little bit about the plan context. Uh, our goals and objectives are public participation in our next steps. Okay. Um, I thought we could dispense with some of the recording since we've lost our audience, but, uh, or at least the, um, the broadcasting. Um, so the, this plan is for the downtown. Um, it's the, um, the downtown area, as, as we all well know. This is, um, there's another plan coming up for the urban open spaces, and this, this addresses the downtown areas. Um, so our, uh, the open space goals have been um, developed over the, uh, the public participation process, so we've been working with people. And we've, 
um, come up with a, a set of goals, um, a variety of open space types for the downtown, diverse and dynamic opportunities uh, within the downtown, linked corridors, streetscapes, and multi-purpose landscape designs. So our objectives are to assess the uh, current open space inventories uh, that we have. What do we have on the ground currently? Is it working for us? And uh, what needs to be, uh, to be updated? Um, to identify new public open space locations um, and to recommend policy and ordinance changes to support our, um, our existing and proposed uh, locations. So our public participation process has, um, has been uh, very dynamic um, and robust. Uh, we've had four public uh, workshops, um, each um, uh, somewhat design charrette workshops where people actually um, drew, identified, uh, came up with uh, locations and came up with some concepts for what they'd like to see in the downtown. They average about 35 to 45 uh, uh, attendees. Um, we've uh, given a survey um, both online and in person for open space uh, needs. Um, and then we've also provided uh, maps and walking tours of the downtown. We've also um, been meeting continuously with DOST um, and have worked with the HBC or um, the head of the HBC, the um, Environmental Affairs uh, Board and uh, the Appearance Commission to keep them in the loop on our progress. So our major concepts are um, a renovation of existing uh, open spaces within the downtown. Um, so we've identified spaces that need an update and there are that need an update. Um, we are proposing new public open space within the downtown. So we've identified areas that with the new development and the growth that's happened since the 2008 master plan, um, we, uh, we've identified areas that we need open space to support that growth. Um, and we also have come up with concepts on improving the connectivity uh, throughout downtown through greenways and enhanced streetscapes. Uh, we will be providing um, conceptual level design for open space concepts. Um, renderings uh, that come out of the public participation process and the staff input on uh, what these designs in downtown Durham could be. So our next steps are to complete the draft, um, give a public review of the draft uh, online, uh, present to our advisory boards, and then planning commission uh, in October session. And then the, uh, we hope to be able to present to our elected officials in December. So that, that's all for now. Thank you. Do we have any questions? I have one. Yes, sir. I have one question. Funding. Funding. Yes. Um, we will be presenting our funding recommenda recommendations uh, throughout that survey. We, we've uh, identified a mix of funding, uh, funding mechanisms, which include current uh, mechanisms um, and uh, mechanism mechanisms that will be uh, proposed, and you'll have the opportunity to review our um, funding mechanisms. Mr. Smusky. Thank you. Since uh, Jackie Brown appointed me to the Durham Open Space and Trails Commission, I've been going to that commission and I've seen the full presentation that, that this was given. There are some amazing ideas that are, are in this presentation. I encourage you to, to, to talk with this, with this man and find out what those ideas are. Uh, we should, you know, there's a lot of good things to be taken into consideration in that. So the Durham Open Space and Trails Committee has seen, seen this presentation. It's a good presentation. I'll be glad to talk to you, and I'm sure this gentleman would too. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No, we thank you. Thank you. All right. Move now to 7C, State Natural Heritage Inventory. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Pat Young with the Planning Department. Um, as you all are aware, the uh, Brook Mass up at the State uh, uh, NC Wildlife um, Office had sent you all an email announcing the update to what they call the Green Growth Toolbox, which is a toolkit produced by the state uh, to help local governments in developing their land use policies and ordinances to protect uh, natural areas and uh, ecosystems. And I wanted to give a, a brief overview of how we're already using those tools uh, here in Durham and then take any questions uh, that you may have or, or comments. Um, the state, uh, Ms. Massa, one of her colleagues, came out about seven or eight months ago and gave a detailed presentation on the Green Growth Toolbox to our staff. We did a, a pretty 
thorough evaluation of, the, of those recommendations. And I think what we realized was that we had already incorporated the vast majority of the recommendations in terms of our buffer standards, uh, in terms of our um, the, the land use st standards and other recommendations made by the toolbox that we could practically incorporate. Um, one of the things that we do do, which to my knowledge is unique to Durham and the whole state, is take the information that the state provides on their natural heritage areas, which they call their natural heritage inventory, which identifies ecologically significant areas in the state. When there's a zoning uh, case that comes before you, we thoroughly evaluate any areas that appear to overlap with the natural heritage inventory, bring that to you all's attention, uh, and ensure that the applicant has made a representation that they're either those resources don't exist on site or they're protecting those resources on site. No other local government uses that database so thoroughly, and, and we're proud to do that, and we think it's been effective in preserving natural er heritage areas. Most recently, you may recall about two years ago, um, the property that is known as South Point at 751, which is where the new Aldi is, and there's a hotel site across from Renaissance Parkway on the west side of 751. So that's just one of the re recent examples. So um, again, uh, Ms. Massa, I, I believe, may be uh, coming to a future meeting to talk in more detail about this, but we just wanted to give you an overview and let you know that we were already well aware of that imp information and we have incorporated it to the extent we can into our, our policies. I'd be happy to take any questions. Do we have any questions? Yes, sir, uh, Mr. Whitley, then. <laughs> yes, it's, it's short. Um, so when you, when you send us a report, it'll already have some, um, you will already, you would include your commentary about whether they met, met those guidelines or haven't met them? Uh, Ms. Massa had sent you all, I believe, a link to the report online. Yeah. Uh, we, we have not done a point-by-point -point analysis of, of that. We have a lot of that information in, in hand, but we haven't done a there, we haven't done a, an analysis where we would look at the state recommendation and say exactly what we've done. Um, that would take a, some time to do, but we certainly could do it. Um, we've done, we've looked at that internally. We didn't produce it as a document where we did a, laid them next to each other item by item, but we have evaluated it. And the ones that we think are practical and legal, um, we've incorporated, we believe we've incorporated. And if you, there's not a, yes, the, R, the analysis of the natural heritage areas is in our staff reports when there is one on site. I'm sorry if I missed your, your thrust of your question there. Is that it? No other questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Move down to 7D, which is any announcements? <laughs> yes. Um, a special thanks to Director Steve Mellon for coming out, checking us out this evening. <laughs> yes. Believe me, it was my pleasure to be here. Uh, I had to sneak in the back door because Pat usually will not let me come. Oh. I'm just letting you know. Uh, yes. Well, it was a pleasure having you. You helped us out a lot. So, uh, any other announcements? Oh, yes, ma'am. I just like to hear uh, what happened with the with the planning department's budget. You know, when it was finally done, I heard something about the counties cutting it, and and then if the county cut it, then the city would have to cut it an equal amount because it has to be 50-50. And how did all that work out? Um, I think it's safe to say that it has not yet finalized itself. Uh, I can share with you that the budget that was approved by the city uh, was the original amount uh, allocated to the department um, and the budget that was approved by the Board of County Commissioners uh, was a, a budget with a reduced amount for the department. However, in the interim, we're working with both of the administrations to determine uh, potential modifications to our work plan and potential budget and what those impacts may be. Ultimately, that will be presented to the Joint City County Planning Committee uh, at their August meeting, and then we'll have to be forwarded back to both elected boards for, for final adoption. So that's, that's all I can share at this point. So they're getting more, well. well we, we appreciate that answer, and I think we'll use our discretion to determine exactly what was said so we can act as individual citizens to uh, kind of get a, 
lobbying effort going on to ensure that our planning department stays intact because we would like to see Durham continue to grow and it's difficult to grow when you don't have planners. And, it, and it's not often you see such a professional staff. Yes. I do have so, one. Yes, sir. One other thing I'd like to remind the chairman is uh, I mentioned I was I have been appointed by the planning chairman to the Durham Open Space and Trails Committee. There are several other committees that are looking for planning board members, and actually, there went the DOST is wondering if if I sh if it's the will of the planning department or planning uh, commission that I be reappointed to the DOST uh, DOS committee. So, um, if that's something that we want to consider at the next meeting, you know, committee appointments, you know, we can consider that. Okay. Seems appropriate to put it for next. I think it's something else. Right. Bi bicycle yeah. and pedestrian committee is looking for someone from planning. Yes. So if we can get a list of committees who's looking for members, then we can. Yeah, we'll make sure we have a full list of available vacant seats for next meeting. Absolutely. Okay. Good. Any other announcements? Yes, sir. I don't have an announcement. I just need an excused absence for next month. I won't be here. Okay. We'll grant that to you now. Who's going to appoint it to all those committees? Okay, so if, if, yes. So if all announcements are clear and everybody's ready to go, we can go ahead and uh, adjourn this meeting.